Okay, hey folks, how's it going? Uh, quick mic check. Hopefully things are going well. I know it's been a while since we've been on. Um, kind of busy with the craziness of all the classes and whatnot. I'm sure you guys can understand, but uh, I've always wanted to make sure I can drop in here once in a while to um, just say hello and to see if you guys are doing well, to sketch with you guys a little bit, chat with you, and um, to be able to just share some time interacting. Uh, if anything I can do to give advice, uh, opinions, thoughts, this is what, we, what we're here for, sharing techniques, methods, uh, educational pathways and whatnot, and using just only based on, of course, my experience and my opinion, uh, to help navigate these waters. So again, welcome for those of you that are for the first time um, here on this channel to be able to just watch and sketch with me. So of course, the ideal thing in this situation is to be able to set up your own little station if you have anything. Uh, sketchbooks are welcome of any type. Digital is also great too. Even if you're just sitting there listening on, doing your own thing on the side, playing game or something else like that, totally also welcome. Um, We'll see how many viewers we do get in today, I'm sure, because if it's a, a last minute or more of a surprise pop-up or it's been also a while, I'm sure people aren't necessarily in tune with when I'm going to come up because I don't schedule things as to when the uh, pop-ups do happen. So apologies because I don't have a set scheduling for us in our channel here. And for me, this is a, a place for me to just come and, um, you know, interact and just have a, a, a time to uh, relax and to share um, so that way it's not so pressure-oriented. What I want to do also is just give me one second. I want to actually adjust my cable here because this is attached to my table and it's shaking the camera and I don't like it. Hopefully we'll get a little bit less jostling from the camera. All right, I'll have to fix that more next time. Uh, the camera that I'm using right now gets... Uh, pulled in and out because of my classes when I go in person so I have to bring my camera set up with me and when I bring it back home uh, all the cables are kind of like jumbled up so again apologies. Uh, anyways uh, welcome for those of you and again for those of you that are coming for the first time uh, questions are welcome. I'll try to do the best I can in being able to reply to some of those questions. Uh, you know I want to make sure I can spend a bit of minutes here and there just to give you guys thoughts and opinions on it. Uh, do support the channel of course you know if you guys are able to donate and stuff like that you know obviously I'm going more to the monetization than that works not really my main sort of income, obviously, but this is a place for me to be at least have some sort of support of my time that I'm offering on being able to interact with people. Uh, and of course, you know, you guys can stay and stick around and watch or otherwise you can look for other sort of resources too. Um, today, we are going to go straight into just sketching and drawing. And I'm just going to be using my brown tone sketchbook, which is uh, my day to day go to sketchbook. I will be using just a fo uh, fountain pen uh, in this situation for us today. Uh, I'll be using probably the two that I have from my Esther Brooks. One's a bit more of a thinner line weight. This one's a bit of a thicker one because of the sh reshaping of the mid. Uh, so we'll see what we can do in this current um, situation. And what we're going to be sketching, I don't have any idea yet. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, so we'll see you in terms of what ends up happening here. I, I had some imaginations and thoughts today about you know certain creatures and stuff like that with, with characters because I was at the LA Zoo uh, earlier this morning sketching with my students. So looking at a bunch of animals all day, like uh, reptiles and mammals and such, kind of gave me some of that visual fuel and source of inspiration to be able to generate something on the page today now. And I had imaginations of things like, of course, you know, mounted dragons and stuff like this with people on them and, and riding them out like that. So it's always fun to draw something a bit more easier, comfortable, things I've drawn before, but maybe in slightly unique and different ways. And so when you guys are warming up and sketching, my suggestion is always to um, loosen up that way. You know, you might have things of your projects, personal work, homework of any type that you are pressured to perform on but before you actually begin a warm-up period is to just go into something you actually really feel comfortable doing so drawing a certain kind of characters or, or you know certain subject matter and themes that you kind of repeat and you know and find a very strong comfort zone in and I know people tend to kind of avoid that hey Nicholas how's it going man um, but at the same time it's a great way to kind of get into the flow and the mix of things Nicholas Namira hanging out right now for a second is actually gonna be having a gallery show here in LA uh, so for those of you that are listening in right now, um, if you were in the LA area, I believe sometime in, what is it, March or April, I'll have to look at the dates again for you, Nicholas, but uh, there was a gallery show happening here at the um, Nucleus Gallery in Alhambra. So come check it out if you guys are going to be in person. I'll try to definitely stop by myself and say hi to every, everyone there. Uh, but a great gallery uh, location and an awesome place to see pop-up work and also see artists that are, you know, very much in the mix of the contemporary uh, trends and popular things that are going on. And Nico being one of them, as part of the Super Ronnie crew, uh, come check it out and support, all right? Um, Casey is saying you're also working on homework trains. Casey is one of the students currently at the moment. And we're drawing trains this session. You know what? I'm going to switch it over to the other fountain pen because this one's a bit thicker of a line. 
I'm going to come back to this for line weight. I'm going to use this one for some of the initial build. Trains. Yeah, that's what they're drawing in the class. All right. So um, the kind of animals that we saw today. Oh, man. Sorry. The camera's changed, shaking a lot. Uh, I saw things like reptiles, obviously, Komodo dragons, uh, mammals, giraffes, zebras, the typical kind of animals that we have at a, at a local zoo. And, um, you know, the mentality is I want to, you know, create some kind of creature that's, you know, ridden by some character. Uh, in my mind, I had this very sculptural look of an angle of you kind of looking up the angle. So you'll see the bottom end of the head over here, neck coming down this direction, possibly the character standing out looking, maybe kind of uh, in reconnaissance to a valley or something like that. So I had this image of a thought in my head earlier today. Um, and I kind of wanted to play with that, but the kind of animal and creature I want to go for here is not going to be so classical sense of like a reptile, like the Komodo dragon. I thought about trying to mix in some other things as well. So creature-esque, obviously, intermixing with many different sort of animals that we can find. I imagine some sort of patterned animal as well, too, because of so many of the, the giraffes and the zebras with the striping and the spotting. So I think something like that would also be kind of fun as well, too. But I have this image of the creature kind of looking over to the left over here. So we're just going to go straight in. Uh, we're not going to necessarily construct or thumbnail this, and I, I do want it to be some sort of, you know, obviously creature s kind of thing. As it moves down this direction, I'm always kind of imagining it having its arm structure down over here, maybe some overlaps of rock landscaping, so I can kind of frame him. I won't necessarily, or I won't be able to draw the entire body form, but I will use some other elements of the visuals to help kind of frame this piece in the sketchbook. All right, so let's keep going into it then. Um, this will be the lower portion of the eye. I'm going to zoom in a bit more too. And if the shaking gets kind of hard to observe, let me know, please, in the chat. And I'll try to go in and move the cable in a different way because it's still shaking for me now. I don't want to break the stream uh, too much. And I do apologize because I haven't set up for a stream in a while. Um, so typically, everything that would have been already kind of settled up, I wouldn't have to go change. But today, we might have to do so. So we'll just kind of sketch for maybe like 10 minutes. And then once that's kind of done to a certain point, and I'm kind of comfortable to where this is at, uh, I'll go and move the cable to the back end. I have to usually hook it on something so it's not shaking the camera. Uh, the cable I'm talking about is the power cable. It's touching my table. So anytime I deal with any sort of movement or, or drawing, it just slightly jostles it. It bothers me, so I, I, I do apologize. So let's go up this direction. I want to be the underside. So I'm also thinking of some of the, the mammals that we saw earlier today. Uh, you know, some other giraffes and whatnot. So I don't want this to be the classic kind of like dragon, dinosaur, reptile kind of influence, but um, you know, definitely even some of the kangaroos were interesting. And I want the mouth to be closed, but we're going to show the underside of the form. Big mandible muscle going on this end. And I thought like the horns being kind of fuzzy from like the giraffes were great. And we incorporate some of those, but in slightly different, unique ways that, you know, we're still trying to draw, basically, a dragon and creature and, and a mounted animal like that. But um, I don't want to go so classical in that sense. I want to come down this direction. The muzzle will split, kind of like a camel to the giraffe. <laughs> some hair. I don't want it to be scaly, reptilian. I want it to be more fuzzy and furry yeah, as a uh, hair-covered animal. We'll give it some ears as well, too. And welcome for those of you that are joining in for us. Uh, first time watching for um, Patreon Park. Welcome. So as the neck comes down this direction, I want to show the underside of the mandible, which will give us the up angle view position. And I want to imagine some gear uh, wrapping around the neck area. As it moves this direction around here, more fur and hair at this end. Some bumps, texture on top of the animal. Slightly adjusting it. We'll get to some of the textural details hatching a little bit later on. Uh, I'll probably pump up some contrast as well too. 
yeah, if you guys are joining in and you know been needing a source of a little bit of a kick to some art talk, community inspiration, uh, welcome in again. Uh, communication and questions are welcome. Do help support the stream. You guys can share it if you can, please, or donate a little bit for any more specific, deeper questions you want me to kind of spend more time on. I will definitely do so. Certain questions that are just being asked, I'll respond to them, but keep it more generalized and a bit more straightforward. Um, and the conversation will be dealt more towards the subject matter and the technique today. Uh, but if there are questions you guys have that require a little bit more investment that you want to get into, uh, consider donating, please. Okay, let's get some patterns in place as well here too. Sketchbook I'm using right now at the moment is uh, from a company called Epica, and they're based out in Italy. And they make these really nice uh, handmade paper um, journals, sketching journals, actual journals. And uh, they made these really, just made this really beautiful paper. Due to the pandemic stuff recently, uh, the last couple of years, I think they took a hit in terms of being able to procure certain um, materials. And I think even the paper makers, I think were retiring or something. I heard, you know, we were talking, I was talking about that with my friend Manny, who also buys a lot of their stuff. Um, and I've only bought in like a couple of journals from them in the last couple of years because a journal like this actually is kind of expensive. But I, I wish I'd bought more because now they're not necessarily, I don't know if they're making the same kind of paper. And this is a really nice one. Um, but, you know, the book that I have at the moment, I'm about halfway through. So I'll definitely make sure I can take advantage of whatever leftover paper I have in this book and fill it up as best I can. Hey, Brad Pye, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate the donation of this. Uh, so question was officially hit a full year since you uh, I first started to learn how to draw you know it's so easy to give up in the beginning but I'm so happy I, I stuck with it and absolutely this is one of those situations where determination hunger is a big part about your growing education because just having the right classes or techniques or even instructors is one thing because they can definitely give you the the elements of, a, of an environment or even information about being able to court you know coordinate your direction as to where to go next uh, and, and that's fine. That's totally good because everyone kind of needs that. But at the same time, having that sense of hunger and determination to stick with it comes from your end, you know, and nobody can force you to tell you to do otherwise. You have to be the one to actually make that decision and choice to commit to the thing. Whether you're doing it right or wrong or well or, you know, whatever the case is, not really that important because everyone's going to start somewhere. And they're going to be starting at a point where they feel like they're not good enough. And as you make those progressions, of course, the, the comparisons will come in based on your historical past of, experience to your current contemporary and you compare those things and you see your natural growth with it um, and so as you continue on obviously going beyond those moments of a wall uh, of course some people feel that burnout and they're having a hard time getting back onto the onto the horse to ride but others you know if they stick with it long enough are able to kind of dig themselves out of that hole a little bit and all of us will face that going down and above and it's a constant wave of a ride uh, that goes into this so um, you know but that's essentially how it kind of rolls and, you know, it, this is or for a bread pirate. It's not also just about um, sticking with it, but maybe you haven't necessarily had that that hit just yet of that slight burnout or that sense of like um, of a wall of, of a skill that you can't seem to get over. And you're, you're sticking with it for a year uh, and you've probably seen some progression and growth, which is fantastic. But once you hit that, that um, you know, moment in time in your in your growth, that stress moment where you just don't really see anything happening, you know, uh, the growth seems to stagnate. Your understanding seems to not really improve. Uh, there are other things you would expect or have wanted to, you know, have changed uh, to ev eventually evolve and show itself, but it just doesn't seem to go the way you want to. And in those, those moments, those real tests then start to kind of pop up. Uh, and that's where, again, I think in terms of recommendation there, it's not just sticking with it. The other things I just mentioned at the beginning, the environment, the, the instructors, the friends you might have, the peers, uh, the inspiration, the things you have hobbies towards, all those elements of variables mixed, uh, mixed and matched together. Family as well too. Health, you know, uh, physically and mentally are all elements you have to be in consideration for. Now it's taxing. It sounds exhausting to consider balancing all those things. But at the same time, they are important. And with more time of, of maturity and experience, you'll be able to uh, navigate those waters a lot better for yourself. So best of luck to you, Red Pirate. And, and you know, it's only been a year. And this is a, a long endeavor for the rest of your life. And the first year does matter. It does set a good tone. Uh, but from there, you know, I think the two to three year mark is definitely a big hurdle to overcome. But, um, you know, do consider about, you know, being just aware of those sensitivity of things in those moments. All right.
There are a couple questions that I just want to just pop in on real fast. Uh, hey, Trimbach is asking, you know, how can you draw so correctly without any construction lines? So today we are, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the stream, uh, I was at the LA Zoo and we were drawing animals. You know, I've drawn animals like, you know, zebras and giraffes many, many times. I've seen them in the wild, you know, in Africa. Uh, and having drawn them so often, you know, my familiarity to those animals are relatively strong. Now, I'm not saying this animal creature right here is specifically of those animals. Obviously, my experiences of any other kind of things are being mixed matched together. I'm just saying I saw animals today. So because of the, the feel of the visual information being that fact of creatures or animals, uh, I want to draw some type of creature of my own. But in terms of what animals I'm really pulling from, it's a mixed match of a bunch of different things. I did mention earlier, I don't want to make a classic reptilian dinosaur looking dragon, but I want to make it more kind of fur and hair oriented with a bit more of a, you know, um, a mammalian kind of look to it possibly to a degree. But either way, it, it, those are the kind of inspirations that I'm pulling from. So in terms of why I'm able to draw without the constructions, because I'm familiar with the process of drawing these kind of things in a regular occurrence in observation. So I've seen many of those animals and I've drawn them in a constructive way. So through that process of many years, I'm able to pick and choose what I construct and don't construct. So just because you think you're, I'm not constructing doesn't mean that you know, I'm not doing that. You just can't see it. And that's usually the, the kind of the um, reply that I give to people that ask that question, which is very common and welcome at the same time. Uh, but that's usually the thought. The Dynamic Bible 2 will be coming out hopefully this year. It's been approved to go ahead to work on, and I'm starting it literally this coming week. <laughs> so that's being uh, started on. And Bread Pirate, if you have anything you want to add to that, uh, you're welcome to jump in because obviously a, re a, a discourse of going back and forth for people that are donating, I would do welcome. So that whatever I'm conveying based on a reply or advice, I hope that you know it's helpful to some degree of thought. But then you can also kind of you know go back and forth in terms of being able to adjust or refine the question if you want to go do so further. JP, how's it going, man? Long time no see. Uh, hopefully we'll catch up soon. So right now we're doing some type of a creature that will have a saddle and a character standing here in the outlook looking at something. I don't know if I'm going to give him, I don't think I'm going to do wings on him. I just want it to be this uh, mounted animal, like a giant camel or horse <laughs> in a way, but, in the, it, but a designed or um, created, imagined thing. I'm starting to go off the, the panel right now, so I want to keep it up to this area right here for now, for the moment. We'll draw for maybe a few more minutes, and I really want to move that cable because it's bothering me still that the camera's shaking. So um, I might shift, shift that right now, actually. Let me zoom out a little bit so you can kind of see the entire image. And give me one moment. Excuse the camera shaking. This will make the overall stream experience a lot better later on. Okay. Thanks for your patience on that. Oh, I had lost my webcam. Let's go back to the YouTube. Oh, that's many cams. Let's close that. Okay, there we go. Sorry, hold on one second. My uh, webcam is off at the moment.
All right, there we go. Okay. Let's zoom back into the image. We might keep it maybe somewhere within that region, just a little bit closer. I'm going to keep working my way back to this direction. So now, no more camera shake. Good. Let's go back up a little bit. There was a donation. Um, oh, no, that was Brett Pie earlier. Well, the question that might be in here, is it better to build from null uh, off the torso or head in my opinion? For a figure drawing, I would say building off of the torso. That's kind of typically how I uh, introduce figurative kind of work in educational formats uh, in my dynamic figure class and whatnot. Uh, I prefer the torso mainly because uh, you can maintain proportion a little bit better. And as you go up into like the limb structure and the heads, you can manage the things like ratios uh, for myself. Because I had a lot of issues when I'm drawing the figure where proportion became way too long in some regions or too short because it started with the head. And I wasn't able to count very accurately by eye. Uh, so starting with the biggest section of an area of the torso became, for me, the best place to begin. Who knows, I was asking, you know, um, you're, I'm doing these kind of random marks on an animal. You're assuming that these are modified forms of hatching. They're, they're indicative techniques of surfacing information of the animal itself. So scaling, fur, that kind of stuff. And it may seem random at the moment, but they have... Uh, specific purposes towards indication of that for, sort of feature of detail uh, and I can then come back into it and tie them together or add more information to that later on but they're more kind of uh, landmarks to come back to essentially. Uh, John Albert was asking if you're going to go to environment illustration instead of environment design should I focus more on the narrative of the composition? Uh, yeah I mean in sort of any sort of design I would say the narrative or the story aspect of it is going to be uh, Kind of primary candidate towards being able to have a successful uh, piece to be able to you know share to an audience member. So it can be beautifully painted as a composition or or in you know digital to analog material materials or themes or subjects. But the story in terms of what you're trying to convey to an audience member in that scene uh, of a shot as an environment design should be you know kind of in the beginning the first thing to really consider and think about. Uh, it's good to hear that, Brad Pirate. Okay. Things have progressed to a level you're happy with the results. I'm able to settle that critical eye easier and not feel so dejected when things don't look as good. Yeah. Proper mindset will help a lot. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm glad you had those awarenesses in mind. Um, Mocha is asking, you know, how serious was I about art when I was in my teenage years? Very serious. <laughs> but it depends on what that means in terms of what the seriousness is. Uh, was I highly interested in developing my skills to work in the field of some type? I mean, yeah, to a degree, whether I made that choice or not, my interest of doing it every day, but also uh, uh, consuming the mediums that I really loved, comics and animations and games, uh, I think were obviously correlated to that without really me understanding the fact that I've made those choices. But because of the fact that I was consuming it so much and I wanted to generate work that was in alignment to it, I think it was inevitable to be able to come to that conclusion of saying, I really want to take that career direction. But as a career sense of, of seriousness, not so much, but in terms of engaging and developing work, for sure, a lot of the times. Me and a friend during high school would always be generating you know, projects and ideas and storylines and concepts. Um, and so we'd be always working together and drawing together and using that as a form of fuel of inspiration, but also co competition to continue to grow. Uh, Arundhan, you got the Dynamic Bible. Well, uh, thank you, appreciate the support on that. Uh, how would you study learn from it if you were me? Uh, well, you know, there is a video on that on YouTube where I go, kind of go through the walkthrough of the book itself. Uh, that might give you a little insight first about how uh, the information on the inside can be potentially seen. Uh, in terms of just being a beginner and kind of working into that, um, you know, content and subject matter, obviously starting from the very beginning. But do consider, you know, taking it upon it as the seriousness of actually taking a class, setting up an actual scheduling, you know, kind of a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week situation. And block it out for like maybe the first two, three weeks at first. It doesn't have to be like months and months. And go for short-term goals as you go through it. Short-term goals could be based on certain numbers of chapters. In the beginning, it could just be about the exercises. I'll do maybe two weeks of the exercises initially. And then the two weeks after that one, I'll go for like some of the subject matter. So don't plan out like I'm going to go through the entire book in two months and do all that work. 
you don't know. You may not be able to actually do so. But if you can, you can say, hey, in a week or two, I want to be able to accomplish this number of things in the exercise that are given me in the book. And once you hit that goal set, then you plan on moving on. If you don't hit it, obviously you kind of roll it back a little bit and reattempt some of the things that you feel like aren't necessarily working so well. We're going to do his hand structure here. Kind of climbing over some type of rock structure. And we'll give him kind of like claws that are retractable like felines. And my lines, I, I want them to be somewhat gestural, energy-based, movement-oriented. I'm not trying to be overly clean at the moment. So if anybody's sketching with me at the uh, currently with, with this whole live stream situation, and we're drawing some kind of, some kind of creature or, or uh, you know, monster or something like that, you're doing your own iteration of it. Your sketch or, or piece that you're developing right now shouldn't be with the mindset of trying to have that precision or polish level. It should be about exploring. Trying to understand, you know, trying to be able to get a sense as to like how it could be approached. And with that understanding of experience and familiarity, uh, to be able to potentially replicate it again with a bit more sense of clarity of control. Uh, but that can come after the, the live stream is done or to be done later in the day, maybe even tomorrow. You revisit that information. So that way you have that sense of comfort and a little bit of confidence to say that this is the iteration that I have done anyways. And whether it's good or bad, I have information that I can use into the next piece. I had this thing today, at the, we're, again, as a reminder, I was at the LA Zoo today at teaching a class. And we're there for about, you know, two and a half, three hours or so. Uh, we did a couple of demos and we started off by looking at some of like the kangaroos and the zebras and stuff like that. And we made our way uh, to an area where all the giraffes were. And um, I was kind of just sketching on my own as some of the students were, were just warming up and, you know, getting some of the, the experiences of drawing observationally. And you know, people are walking all around. And this group of people kind of walked behind and they stood there for a little bit, as some people will do. And I can feel the presence of people, but it doesn't really bother me. I don't care if they could watch. And um, one of the, the members, the person that was there, he, he walks up to me and said, hey, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure, of course. And people come and talk to me all the time. And the sketches I was doing of the giraffe had, you know, the not this. It wasn't going straight in. I had Things like shape of circles and lines and cross contours and constructive things to build an animal. Uh, and I was using a pen. I was drawing a large format as well, too. I had a big piece of like uh, a spiral bound um, tone tan paper. It was gray tone from Strathmore. It was like 18 by 24 inches. And I got that big one because I want to show demos on a larger scale. And I was drawing with a, a Tombow pen. And I bought a Tombow pen to sketch and draw with. And so I had that on the page. So I was sketching and he asked me that question again, it was a, which was, um, how do you get rid of the circle? You know, when you're sketching, you know, I see your shapes, I see a circle there, I see a line there. It's like, how do you get rid of it though? Because doesn't it bother you that it's there? Uh, and what if you, you know, um, doesn't it stand out? And that's what he literally said. Doesn't it stand out in comparison to all the other like sort of details of lines that are in place, which is my, my assumption as to what he meant in the question. But his literal question was, how do you get rid of the circle? Doesn't it stand out to you? Uh, and I mentioned to him like that was like, well, it's all based on intention. It's situational because uh, it's based on the fact that I have a different approach towards what I'm doing right now on location, which is there's two factors I can apply here. Uh, one is producing a piece like you're mentioning, which is maybe straight to a polish of an illustration, a piece that I'm generating that could be, you know, printed or sold or, you know, done for an actual job or something like this. And then um, I then said, well, the vice versa to that. Is that what I'm doing right now because I'm in a class with people and I'm, I'm also in the mode, mode of mindset into that, which is to study. So I could, be, I could be illustrating the giraffe or I'm going to be studying the giraffe. So when I'm studying it, uh, I'm going to actually go into the constructive mode of things. How do I build it from the inside out? How do I get the proportion correct? You know, how do I place in some general sense of anatomy? Uh, where do I indicate landmarks, right? In a pose or standing position, stuff like this. And I said it to him, he's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's like I, I, he, he understood the intention behind how that was supposed to be built. Now, was he an artist? I have no idea. And, and he was like, oh, that's great. And that's good information uh, because it clarified from the understanding as to like why certain people would do certain things like that and why they wouldn't in other ways. I think general public can lump it all together as, you know, how a quality or value of a piece of art can be determined by the final actions of what it looks like at the final state of the last moments of a mark or a paint stroke. 
So if it's you know non-constructive and it goes straight to an illustration, people will consider this right now what I'm doing more valuable than me doing a simple sketch of shape and forms. And that is proof again of how people can observe uh, the the methods of approach on a technique and how we as artists need to be able to navigate again that that kind of situation. Because if you convince yourself that what you should be doing is what I'm doing now, that every sketch that you do, and when it's educational or you're trying to produce something for, for some client or for yourself as a project, for a book print, I don't care what it's for, that the mindset is about being able to generate something that is in quote unquote finished. And this is something I bring into the classes that I teach all the time. The difference of understanding of intention, right? What's finished to you? And is finished only that one state as to what it's supposed to be as an image that has no construction, no underlay. Uh, no dependency of things like references. I can just go straight in there and paint and draw this thing and have that piece automatically as I want it. And that's that misconception, right? Because they don't know. The general audience, the people that were walking by who could just be regular people have no concept of that, about what we as artists are trying to do as a training method because all they consider is just the value of the way things look at the finished end piece. So they, they only judge it by that sense. So of course I understood you know, his questioning and, and uh, I, I understood how his perception was. For me to explain it that way, to have him understand and open up to the ideas of the differences of approach and intentions, all of a sudden clicks for him. And he realizes instantly, he, I saw it in his face, and he mentioned to his other friends, like, oh, he's studying, studying. That's what he's trying to do right here. Uh, they understood why that would be the case. So um, when you guys you know, go into your future, as also as you develop your own skill sets, if you're worried about the way it looks, and uh, you know, I shouldn't be constructing as much, and you know, I don't want to use as much reference. I'm going to draw from memory to be able to really, you know, establish everything I want to in terms of details and, you know, all the refinements of areas of things. Or you're concerned about line quality and it's so messy and it's like chicken scratches everywhere. Uh, all that does is it creates anxiety and concern about, you know, how you perform and how you're seen by others. Um, but if you're sure and confident about what you're actually even trying to do, all that melts away. Because when he came up and asked me that question, I'm not trying to defend myself. I'm not trying to say, oh, you know, don't look at my work. It's, you know, I'm just kind of training right now. It looks really bad. There is none of this because I know what I'm trying to do and it's very intentional. And by explaining it that way, he understands that. And because of the confidence behind it, he, he is able to perceive that work, what I've generated in the same way. So through the information and education, that person has now brought up that level through, you know, the, the um, identity between the, the ideas of actions and expectations. So, when you're able to have that sense of clarity within your own work or process, uh, that's where the confidence, again, goes up. Because you're no, no longer sitting there doubting, self-doubting yourself of skill and comparing through others because you think it has to look a certain way. Because it's no longer about what it is doing to other people, but it's what's for you. How do you grow, right? How do you gain your skill sets and confidence levels of things? There are times in which, of course, being able to build through teams having this social aspect of, of stuff to share things and compare and contrast and get feedback, that kind of stuff is also critical as well too. But having that sense of surety of self uh, is something to be mindful of. Um, so I hope that, you know, when you guys go on, you know, that little experience today kind of, again, further cements my understanding about how I try to convey that thought process of uh, what you're actually even trying to do when it comes to sketching, right? Anyway, sorry, that was a tangent. Uh, that was just something that ha happened. Uh, when somebody came up to uh, came up to me at the zoo, and I, I really like those kind of interactions because as I'm able to inform them on on those this kind of situation of what we're trying to go for, their sense of understanding and clarity reminds me also of the fact that anybody coming off the street, I can teach them how to draw. <laughs> you know, uh, people can you know be concerned about talent level and stuff like this, but I've taught people from all walks of life, people who've never drawn anything in their life before, and we're just curious about art, and they're taking a class with me in drawing. And they would be surprised at how much they can actually control in certain things. Um, so when people come up like that, it, again, like I said, it continues to remind me the fact that it's not talent. It's just the investment and the interest that you have to invest in fully for yourself in this field of art and design uh, that would take you to those next plateaus. Anyways, I just find that interesting. So. so Last Colonel was asking price commissions for a family. They want you to do a few designs for a t-shirt, sell on their online store. I'm thinking of just getting paid for the design and not for every shirt sold. Um, so there's, such, there's so many elements of uh, specifics I would need to know about, you know, giving you the specifics of information and advice. But in general, 
uh, I would say pricing wise, of course, you know, if you could just if you're comfortable with just doing one piece and giving it to them and having them make as many prints as they want to to make that money off. I think for me, the big situational thing here is about how big that company is. You know, if this family that generates um, shirts and stuff like this is a big store, I'd probably be writing contracts. I probably would be getting, you know, a certain percentage from each sold shirt, uh, retaining ownership of the artwork as well too, licensing it to them to be able to use. But that's, you know, a lot of the elements of like law and whatnot and contracting that you would have to consider. But if it's just like a, you know, a family that's going to sell shirts here and there, if you're comfortable just like doing the work and giving it to them, then fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's just being aware about who you're dealing with in that situation. Because I've done it many times where I would, you know, work with people and they would say, hey, can you do me a piece of work? And I'll pay you like 500 bucks for that piece of art. And I'll do it and I'll give it to them. And they'll have it. I don't own any ownership and, and there's no conversation of stuff like this. And they print as many shirts as they want to. And I don't, you know, get percentages of royalties and stuff like that because I know they're not trying to sell thousands upon thousands of shirts. You know, they're selling like, like a handful here and there every month. Um, so I'm not, not going to be so concerned. So it's very situational in that case. Okay, we're going to build rock structures coming down over here. More landscaping on this side. I'm going to put a character up here. And what he's going to be doing is I want him to like be holding some sort of like telescope or, or binocular kind of thing. We're just kind of viewing off into the distance. So I thought about having him with his knee up over here coming down. So let's draw his knee first. He's going to be wearing some kind of knee pad. Let me zoom in a bit more so you can kind of see that portion of it. Sharon, uh, welcome again. Uh, sir, if you had to leave class early last class because you're getting super sick. Well, I hope you're feeling better, Sharon. Uh, you're part of the class right now, but I just hope that you're enjoying the experience so far. Uh, glad you're here joining with us, but you know, making sure priority of your health and physical on that side of it is more important. So make sure you're getting a lot of rest, okay? So this is gonna be his leg coming down this direction. I had a bunch of straps and maybe like material, and some like furs and stuff out here. And he'll be standing on the saddle like this. And let's give it a bit more of a clothing indication. Maybe that like side skirt or long uh, shirt or something like that. This is the back silhouette of his back leg. Um, cloaks and rags and stuff hanging off of him over here. Maybe some type of pack. More clothing indication. This is the lower half. This is where his hips are. Coming up this direction will be um, his torso coming up. And I think I'm gonna have him facing this direction. So as we have maybe a shoulder region up here, arm comes up this direction. Elbow's gonna be about there. Still drawing loosely, not being concerned about quality just yet. We'll refine all this stuff in a bit in a bit. And this is where some of the cloth and cape will be kind of flowing off in that direction. Cross straps, maybe for the shoulder pack or something like that. Some type of scarf here. He's not really the focal point, so I don't really need to make sure he's like super detailed and stuff like that. We'll come back to these details in just a moment. His other hand's going to be over here, and I wanted to hold some type of leash or strap work again. Just so he's kind of holding onto something. Again, very kind of indicative. A lot of this stuff I'm going to drop down in the values and the shadows, so I'm not concerned if you can kind of see it or not. 
because this is just a character kind of in a situation of a, of a you know a shot so with the combination of the entirety of everything his detail level should be somewhat lower because i really want to reinforce the creature a bit more And we'll come back to him and start adding more stuff to later on. Uh, let's see, a couple of questions. Sharon's asking, do you think uh, you'd ever do a creature design class? Uh, have you always just wanted to learn? Well, that's what I'm planning to do next session. So for those of you that don't know, I do teach classes online under my own program. And currently, I'm teaching a character design development class, uh, dynamic sketching, and also a figurative drawing class. And the next round of classes will begin in May. Registration will begin sometime in April. Uh, and you can watch, you know, or follow my social media, Instagram and stuff like that. I'll post it up as to when it's going to happen. And um, next session, I plan to bring back dynamic sketching, the figurative drawing, but I will be introducing a care, uh, creature development class as well, too. And the creature development will be in tune tied with how I develop creatures of ideas biologically in a world and how they situate themselves. And so you've seen probably my fantasy journal that I have of all the biological kind of studies in the fantasy island. Um, it'll be kind of in tune with that kind of approach and generating then your own creatures in a similar kind of way. So generating journals and stuff like this. Am I going to color this dragon? I'm not sure just yet. Uh, I think this creature, I might keep it black and white. I'm going to put a lot of um, contrast line work in this. Not a ton, but as much as I can to a comfortable level. We'll see how far I go. I'm going to give him additional accessory packs back over here. Pull it up a little bit. Uh, we're only going to be hanging out for another hour or so, so we got a good amount of time to spend and sit down and hang out for a little bit. So a couple of questions. Um, what you mentioned earlier about sketching and construction, how can we not fall into this repetition trap uh, that I'm not improving in my art, but I'm just constructing over and over again? Uh, good question, because, you know, there is always that concern uh, where by training into the technical side of things where the figurative work or the whole dynamic sketching methods of breaking down shape and form, sometimes it's really easy, or I guess not easy, but more of a sense of a slight uh, hesitation to move into that route so, so heavily because we're afraid to get stuck in that side of only constructing and not being able to generate pieces that could be seen as illustrations or polished finished work. Um, you know, I, I would say that first, of course, that shouldn't really be a big concern that is driving your decisions as to how much construction that you're kind of placing into things. Because, you know, the, the idea of construction is such an element of importance on being able to build confidence and to understand a visual vocabulary of many things that you would want to draw, even if it is isolated to just a human figure. Because in the human figure, maybe you want to pose in certain ways or push the camera in certain angles or do foreshortening effects and whatnot or generate scenes, right? Um, but I think another part on being able to improve your work where you're able to move beyond just only a construction and being able to generate you know images and illustrations or sketches or studies that don't become so reliant on them is you know being very mindful of your editing process this is just generally through maturity and there's two ways you can kind of see these aspects of what you can actually literally do in training one is that as you actually construct many things and this construction is a part of building a framework that is a visual representation of the things you're drawing whether it's a scene of an environment or a creature or a human or an accessory or clothing or whatever the case may be. We can use elements of line and shape and form, piecing it together like a puzzle piece to generate the visual representation of that stuff. Now, construction becomes very visually dense and heavy sometimes. So as we draw through things like circles and lines across contours, they become visually distracting for some people. So you want to move away from that sometimes because you want to be able to get to a piece of an illustration that is much more uh, as we had talked about earlier, this side of being more polished, right? So um, how can I avoid this? You know, do I you know, just use maybe certain, what people will do, of course, as an example, is to draw with underlays, pencil or something like that, and they'll erase it out and they'll ink it. Another way is to do underlays with the overlay of like vellum uh, to do another drawing on top of that. Uh, of course, with digital, you can do layering systems and that can do an underlay study that's really rough and then do a new layer on top to control that. 
So there's ways of being able to, you know, in a classical sense of art, do layering systems to control the clarity and cleanliness of the piece. So that's obviously of one way. Um, but that's also, you know, that's the technical approach of a, of a material. The two things that I was talking about earlier goes back to the idea of the training method, which I think is about being very uh, aware of your choices that you're making, of how much construction you're actually doing and how much construction you don't need to have. So you're able to bypass certain steps because you become very familiar to those steps. So when I'm drawing the human figure and I understand the pose that I want, I don't need to construct all of it because I know where things kind of are. So I'll show indications of the construction, but I don't have to necessarily draw every single piece of it, right? That's one step. The other part is also being able to, being able to do a lot of master copies. Master copies of seeing other people's work and illustration that you're trying to parallel with also then gives you the outcome of what you are trying to hit. So being able to do master copies builds the experience about what that finished polish level needs to be for you. It's not about trying to be that person, but it does give you an example of experience to understand what it takes to get to that level, what that visual finish really is. Combine those two elements together, then hopefully you start to have more control as to what you want to do. I hope that makes sense, Hermes. Sorry, not drawing enough here. So let's go back into the drawing. At this point, what I want to do, I have most of the elements that I want. I, I kind of want to give them like a crazy tail or something like this. Uh, this is another kind of landscape rock form over here. Um, let's kind of raise up his leg in this direction. It'll be more just kind of indicative than anything else. We'll leave that out for the moment time being. We're going to just concentrate more information back to this region. Let's start adding some smaller details, pieces, parts. I don't think I'll be doing watercolor in this stuff, so I'm going to keep it just black and white. Moke was asking, do you think concept art is physically straining, uh, a physically straining job? Uh, you are half blind, but I would like, really like to be a concept artist. I'm currently working towards it, but you're worried it'll be exhausting. Uh, anything can be exhausting that requires a certain amount of skill, right? And that's within the physical side and the mental side of it. Uh, the mental exhaustion is from just the, you know, the amount of time you're investing into sitting and doing that and focusing on the subject matter and the method and techniques of how to do it. So it's draining. The endurance of that can be built up through your education right, and experience. Physically, is it exhausting? I'm not going to lie to you, it is. And people would say otherwise, like, well, you're sitting there drawing all day. How really hard is that? A lot more physically endurance-wise difficult than you might imagine, uh, to the point where th certain physical engagements can hurt you in ways. But if you're also, let's say, um, having a certain you know, uh, aspect about you physically that maybe hinders you a little bit, would it potentially you know, strain you more? Well, you would have to maybe kind of push a bit harder because of certain aspects of what you don't have. You're saying you know, maybe you have, your vision is not as good. You're saying you're half blind. Whatever that may mean, is it because you're unable to see in one eye? Are you able to only see a certain portion of clarity? Uh, even things like color or things like definition could be a part of the case. Um, whatever that factor may be, could it be just a bit more exhausting for you? Yes, because it requires a bit more physical strain for you to sit there and do it. But does that mean that you're not going to be able to have the potential to be able to reach certain levels of being a concept artist? No, of course you can make it. It's all dependent upon how much investment you put into it and also based on discipline and passion. Because from the discipline to the passion, no matter how long it takes for you to get there, to become a conceptual artist, to whatever that whatever that means, whether you're working for a company or doing your own thing, uh, because if you if you only formulate success and making it as being having you know an actual full time art position, I mean I can understand how most people maybe see it that way, but I think it it also could mean the idea of being able to generate your own work, which is in my opinion just as legitimate. But if we're talking about financial success, I, I mean I understand that's something a bit different because in the beginning just generating your own stuff doesn't mean financial gain. Uh, it's obviously of your own production and it's still really good to do, but is it seen as professional, right? Um, so if we're going to label professional as being only industry level, uh, yeah, anybody has the potential to get there, even regardless of your age or physical detriments or something like that. But as long as you have the passion into it and it shows in your competitive nature, it may be exhausting, but if you love it enough, you're going to want to do this. And if it does take you a lifetime to do it, because then if you have that much passion, then it doesn't matter how long it will take. Uh, you'll invest that degree. But if you're saying, one in two years, I want to start working and, and, and making money doing concept art, well, then you're in the wrong uh, field, in my opinion. Uh, you're in it for the wrong thing. And there is no guarantee that will happen. And even, even if that did happen, 
the longevity of you being in the industry may not actually be there for you because of that, you know? I don't mean to be harsh in any way. Uh, I, I do want to be encouraging and supporting, and I do hope that things work in your favor, okay? Uh, obviously, you should pursue it. Nobody should tell you otherwise. If there's something you really love to do, go after it, man, you know? But I think people should also be straightforward in, in those situations in terms of how they really think it could go in that scenario in their mind. It's only an assumption. It's only an estimation. But it, it is still a thought based on experience of what I've seen in the past of my own of working in the industry and other students getting out there and doing it. Um, it's not easy. You know, it's very competitive. There's a lot of there's many more people wanting to do it. So uh, could it be that much more physically exhausting for you in this situation of, a, of your case? Uh, I, I think it could be. But again, go for it. Prove it to yourself. S see it to the end. Take it as far as possible. To the very end, <laughs> if you have to. Okay, what I'm going to do is switch it over to a different pen. You know what? I'm going to go back into this guy real quickly and just kind of indicate some features. We're not going to do that much because I just want to do a bunch of shadow shapes. So we'll fill that stuff in later on. Patrick Colos group. Hi, welcome there. Yeah. Greetings from Colombia. Welcome for people from Colombia. Uh, I appreciate your comment. Thank you for stopping by again. Maddie was asking, have I tried comics? I have. Uh, I made my own comic, graphic novel, a couple years ago. Uh, the Blacksmith is something that I generated. For some people that follow me here that would know the property that I had, uh, that was only available through the Kickstarter and I sold it through Comic Cons and shows. Um, I am planning to continue it going into the future. It's kind of on the back burner because of the other books that I'm doing, but I am going to continue on with that book, that story of the blacksmith. It will continue to happen. Uh, there are other things coming out for it, though. I, I'm planning to release a sculpture um, in collaboration with Plastic Cell, who sculpted this really great piece for me of the blacksmith. So in terms of the next show where I'll present stuff like that, it'll be at the uh, Monster Palooza. Monsterpalooza Expo Convention here in Pasadena in June. Monsterpalooza is basically a big convention that has a lot of like movie makeup effects and creature designs and stuff like that. And I really love that show and have a table there. And June 4th weekend, I think. Something like that. Sorry, you're seeing my cat back there. <laughs> uh, I think you can see her. Maybe not. Oh, those are my shoes. That's on that side. Let's keep pushing in with this thing. Uh, now that I have the understanding of a bit more line weight and details, I'm going to consider just a general light direction, just from top down, because maybe it's kind of shining, covering his, his face a little bit like this. So I'm going to maybe push a bit more contrast and shadow shape below down here. So let's just start to fill, fill some of this area in. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but sometimes the best thing to do is just go for it. <clears throat> I'm about to hit uh, 50,000 subscribers on YouTube and YouTube has been a very good place uh, in, in terms of, you know, generating content and, you know, video content wasn't something that I, I always did. Uh, it was mostly static images and sketches that I would share, share on Instagram. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are very aware of just how it feels on things like social media and Instagram right now being a bit kind of hindered by algorithm and stuff like that. Uh, and right now, the big thing that's trending and is really popular are videos and short clips and stuff like this. And I don't really do reels and uh, I don't do TikTok stuff. And, and, you know, videos are not necessarily something I would turn to as a, as a content of medium. But YouTube makes it a bit easier for that because I kind of treat it like an actual interactive class kind of session, you know. So because I'm used to teaching, you know, online, uh, YouTube makes it a little bit easier for me to be able to just jump on. Um, because I kind of dedicate that time to be able to do so. But I don't necessarily go around with my phone and take videos of little clips of me sketching and drawing. It just, I, I think it's fine for people when they do it, but uh, I think it's more work than the return that I get from it. <laughs> so if I'm gonna put work into it, I want it to be an actual prolonged thing. So the YouTube you know, channel actually makes more sense for me to do so. And, and thankfully it's been progressing and growing at, at a steady rate, even when I'm not really on. <laughs> 
So even though I'm not necessarily interacting and being here all the time, the channel continues to grow uh, with the content that I do have. So I've noticed that. And um, I've, I've decided to, you know, obviously wanted to invest into it a lot more, which I'll continue to do so as best I can. So. Well, I, you know, I, Vander is saying, you know, your spies haven't hit 50,000 already. I'm not expecting this to be anything massive or gigantic. And even if it, even if it is, it's not necessarily the reasonings of why I'm, I'm trying to push it that degree of some type of, you know, financial gain of it like that. Because, um, you know, I've been doing these kind of sharing of videos for numbers of years now. And uh, regardless, I'm getting, you know, a lot of sponsorship or stuff like this or not, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm still going to generate these videos to share just to talk. Um, you know, it's nice to have a little bit of that as a potential, you know, viable option going into the future of being an actual thing where I can maybe lean on towards things. Because as an independent artist, you know, it's all I got is just my classes and a little bit of freelance work that I do. And I can live uh, off of those things, but none of that stuff is guaranteed to last forever. So having other elements that are going on within platforms and, and methods of way of being able to generate and have work, um, I'm, I'm going to look into, of course. So and it's not like, you know, even if you are working full time, there's no guarantee you're going to be at that job forever either, too. So if you are working at a company, it's smart to explore the, the opportunities and the options using your skill sets, using your, your um, you know, abilities on projecting them into other areas, I, I think is a good thing. So even if you're younger, inexperienced, starting this kind of stuff, because it's all free. You know, it doesn't necessarily take anything away from you. Uh, it's not easy. And when you do have expectations on it, it doesn't necessarily help with the way it feels for you. I mean, you can't take it to that level. But at the same time, you know, I'm glad to see that you know, something like this is, is potentially a viable option for me and for you guys to be able to help interact and share and that kind of stuff. So again, I appreciate you guys hanging about. Go up a little bit there are a couple of additional questions that i missed uh, again these would be quick uh if you if anybody can donate i'll definitely invest a lot more time of really getting into the question and some of them i'm sure i mean i'm actually getting deeper into it than i intended but still i can't help but doing that uh, i was asking you know you felt that when i go to drawing the head from the imagination i'm able to do it um when i go to draw a figure i'm able to do it but when it comes to putting these things together from the imagination you fail uh that you know i don't necessarily have an answer as to like what you can actually do to to solve that i mean i'm sure that you're not looking for an answer uh to be able to just share that that dilemma hopefully others can see it and be like hey i have that same problem too you can kind of share ideas but um i can understand you know how that can feel based on being unable to bring the two elements of studies together because you what you probably have done is separated them as a way of how you focus in, in a training method meaning that how you approach the head and how you approach the figure are kind of specific ways. And when you bring them together, those ways of specific processes are conflicting essentially. So because they don't fit together, you haven't practiced enough when trying to find the connected dots. So the only thing you can do is obviously invest time to just finding the discoveries of having that happen. Whatever technique or method you look into it might give you some guidance and ideas, but at the end of the day, you're the one that has to make the discovery of how to bring those two elements into cohesion. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully based on time investment, you'll get there. And I, I hope that you do. But for me, I think an example to this was where I took for myself the upper torso and I would always separate it from the lower body. So I would always avoid the legs because I was really bad at drawing legs when I was a student. Uh, I was really bad at proportioning and positioning and posing it. They always looked broken and weirdly off in perspective. Uh, so I always avoided lower bodies. And then I was called out on it. I would tell this story to my students all the time, but I was called out on that in a sketchbook back when I was a student uh, showing it to a professional. He was a Disney animator and artist and I showed him my sketch. He's like, oh, you draw planes and tanks really well. I can't draw those things. But then he would look at my figures and be like, you seem to only draw the upper torso. You know, you should maybe go into more posing and draw the entire figure and that kind of stuff. And I realized I was doing that without actually really realizing it, you know? Um, so then ever since he called that out, now for myself, I can't help but wanted to draw the entire figure you know? because uh, I want to make sure that I would solve that potential problem. Uh, but I would avoid it because I knew, uh, not that I knew, but it was difficult to control the entirety of the figure itself. So I get a sense of what you're talking about here. Harry Seal is asking, you know, how do you view social media as a tool for artists? Uh, I've delayed fundamental studies for a while because they didn't look shareable on Instagram. Well, uh, again, for me, there, I, have, I could spend literally 
an hour talking about this, but <laughs> we're not going to be able to do so. Uh, at the end of the day, as a general reply to this question, I think social media, specifically at places like Instagram, as an artist, from an artist's perspective, is a very necessary and important tool to use now. Um, from a personal standpoint, from a general audience standpoint, I think it's unhealthy. It can be very uh, sickly in terms of your imbalance in life and where you invest your time into. Uh, but because of the fact that for me, my Instagram and social media are places where I do business, where I do a lot of my marketing, uh, being able to connect to people, uh, network, and to be able to share these things as an actual viable source on uh, a platform to get my stuff out there. Uh, from an artist's perspective, I think it's a very great tool set. And there's no better time than now to be a creator because you have access to just dozens, if not hundreds and thousands and millions of people uh, to potentially to see the things you actually generate because you're obviously passionate in the investments and creations that you do. Uh, now, despite all the you know noise of that's going on out there from the tech and all of the other things that are coming into play, which is a necessary argument to have right now in terms of what's going on, and they should be engaged and, and spoken about. Uh, but you know, regardless of all that, from just the simpleness of you being a creator and wanting to share stuff, you should start now. You shouldn't wait thinking that, oh, my skill sets, either fundamentally or creative-wise, is not ready or good enough. I'm not going to share it until I feel like it is. When do you think that's going to happen? When do you think you actually would even realize that? In my opinion, not really ever. Because as artists also, we're going to be in the mindset of constant criticism. Oh, my work isn't still as good as that person. I want to become better in my detailing of lines or ideas and stories. There's always a thing to work on. It never ends. Now, you can embrace that and, and know the fact that that's a natural system of how you, you know, continue to grow. And I'm not going to be overly concerned about it and eventually share. But when you're a student or someone who's beginning, if that's the state of mind that you have and it perpetuates and continues to grow and gets deeper into your system of thought, you're never going to feel ready to share things. So by the time you feel like, well, maybe I'll start sharing stuff at that point, maybe it's been years. And you could have shared stuff way before. And um, that would have been a much better time to potentially begin. So I wouldn't wait. And if you're concerned about like, what if people make bad comments and stuff like that? Well, turn your comments off, you know, because uh, it's not about the comments. It's about being as a place to drive you, to continue to engage, uh, to be able to share, to see what others are doing, to be able to compare and contrast in a friendly way. Because then you can learn from that positioning to say that, how can I then continue to grow and, and you know, uh, progress on my own manners of getting my skills to higher. So I think it should be used as a way to, as a data standpoint, not as a reputation thing. Not looking for the likes and hunting for those kind of things. Uh, we don't, you don't need them at the moment. And you know, do they make a difference in the sense of like building a business and making products and stuff like that? I mean, sure, of course. And when you get to a certain point, having the right network and connections can potentially help you there for success. But that's not going to be the driving force of, of primary, you know, focus at the moment. But do in time, right? Do in time. I mean, even for me, I started with zero in the beginning, right? I started using Instagram in 2013, and I started with zero also. And from zero, eventually grew. And I'm not necessarily the biggest you know, out there. And there's people out there that are far better. But I'm also confident and enjoy what I do. I recognize the, the differences in not quality, but experience levels and trends and people interested in certain things. But there's room for all of it. You know, room for all of it. You can see the shadow side being integrated right now here. So earlier I had a question about these marks being random, but I'm going back to them as landmarks to show overlaps of things like fur or skin or flesh. And I can now use heavier line weights and hatching to show overlaps of that information to show more three dimensions. So we come back to these origins of the initial marks and integrate them into the rest of the image. And so they're not so random looking anymore, but they have actual unity and purpose behind a communication aspect of the surface. Estimat is asking, do you have any advice for a new artist trying to establish an audience? Um, well, first, I'm trying to figure out, like, you know, should that even be really a priority for you, uh, having an audience in the first place? Can an audience be generated by the byproduct of you actually doing something? Of course, anybody can have an audience because of that. But should that be the driving force of why you're doing what you're doing? I ho certainly hope not. But I'm certainly not going to say that you shouldn't do that and that you should you know, avoid and do something else. You can do what you want. You're an adult. Um, so if you're looking for an audience, well, then go seek it. But you know, what could you do in that situation? If I was to give advice to that, obviously entertainment, right? Make it fun. Tell stories. 
people love stories. Talk about yourself. Talk about the things you've gone through. Use your art to be able to generate that. Uh, generate products that can be a part of this. Be a performer. And if you're saying, well, I'm not an actor. I'm not a singer. I'm not, you know, I don't dance. And if I do my art, I'm not a performer. But that's what you're asking about. If you want an audience, you want to perform. So if you're not interested in performing, then forget the audience. All right, we're starting to get some of that shadow siding here again. I'm not going to touch too much on this end. I want that light to come in from this direction. Right now I'm hatching with the forms of some of the surface area of texture. And then also now hatching with the direction of some of the fur and overlaps. I'm trying not to rush through this thing because I want to prolong the stream as much as I can because, you know, we potentially still have an hour to be able to hang out or 40 minutes. Um, I could have gotten this done way quicker. But usually in these kind of streams, I'm, I'm usually kind of hesitating to go too quick because, you know, these streams would end up being like 30 minutes. So um, I'm not trying to gloat in that situation. I'm just saying that, you know, um, usually when I do sketch, I'm sketching pretty quickly. So if I'm not engaging with you guys and I'm just working, usually I'm just sitting on a couch and watching something and drawing. I'm hammering through these things real fast. So Not because I want to. It's just that's just the way I draw. So. A couple of questions here from Altimotros. Uh, to get to this point where you just go in with the pen, uh, is this a product off just getting to know your subject matter extremely well? Simple answer, yes. Familiarity. Being familiar to what you are trying to create, whether through inspirations of things of observation, things you've seen in parallel of existing drawings and sketches and artist's work, and being able to culminate that through the experience of actually doing it in mileage of activity, that is the answer. Yes. Do you see the picture as you're drawing or does it just flow out of you? Flow. I have an idea. From the idea, it visualizes it comes together eventually. Let's go inside the ear here. Maybe there's a bit of a cast shadow here underneath the ear as well too. Shadow shapes underneath their mouth. On the giraffes, they had those horns with like this really dark, tough to pair, which I like. So I'm going to kind of use that as inspiration to pull into here as well, too. I've got about, I think, 80 viewers right now. Um, welcome for those that are joining for the first time again. Uh, if you are, you just pop in, say hi, tell us where you're from. Uh, it's great to have you guys aboard and just hanging out, drawing, sketching maybe with me. And if anybody has any questions, you can definitely ask, and I'll try to answer them as a quick kind of general uh, sense of questions. Anybody that wants something a bit more uh, in-depth of reply, I welcome a donation to the, to the stream. Uh, to be able to just help support the channel, uh, to keep it going with also the time that I invest into this. Uh, so yeah, again, thank you guys for being here. And we're on our way to hit that 50K. So we'll see if we hit that next milestone into the future. Who knows how long it'll take. It'll probably take years to be able to hit that 100. But um, that's okay. We'll keep doing this. This is not some kind of like professional production, so <laughs> don't expect that. Uh, I can only do what I can do, you know, so just having a camera set up and just sharing with you guys is the best we can give it to go for. Let's see a couple of the questions above. Um, Venter, he had asked or said, you actually ins uh, inspired me, and that's yours asking or saying, to stream your own drawing process. You did it once, felt kind of strange, posted my stuff online before, but drawing in front of someone was out without seeing them felt strange. But I'm glad you did. I hope it was a good experience. Um, and having a lot of positive response and engagement in that way. Because again, like I said, it can be not a situation where it's about you being above and they're being below. It can be a mutual you know, element of sharing. 
yeah, sharing that story about the half body thing. Um, Hawk Tan Dog is saying, my mentor wishes you moved on, uh, move to expand your skills from environment to character skins. Advice to take the leap. Uh, my question is why? <laughs> you know, why go from environments to characters? The question your mentor should be asking is, what do you like to do? No, I'm not judging your mentor and what he has to, or he or she is supposed to be doing. I'm just saying, why is that question even coming into play? Uh, of, you know, or not even a question, but more of a statement to what you should be doing with your own interests and stuff. It should be about being able to encourage you and support your directions of things. And you give you advice based on your direction of choice. But um, if you're saying, you know, if you like characters, then, and you're working on environments, then of course that you would want to be supported by that. But if you're being kind of advised to move away from something that you feel like you want to do, but there's something else because it's going to be a better option of a choice for some reason, I don't agree with that. Uh, I don't agree with it because I think you should be focusing on the passions of interest that you have because you'll invest into it for time. Um, now, you know, as an st early student, you should also be experimenting with many things. If that's a situation where you should play with multiple of these themes, environments, creatures, and characters, just try them. Kind of see what they feel like. And then you can make the, the real choices because you have a comparison of how it felt and what you really liked. That I can understand. Um, but if it's a different situation of like, you know, taking your skills to expand on them from environments to characters to move away from environments, which maybe I'm reading that wrong, uh, then I would be a little bit apprehensive of that. But if it's just to expand on just to play and see what can happen within your edu early education, for sure. But eventually, you should have a primary direction, in my opinion. So I'm going to kind of skip through a bunch of stuff in the bottom here. I apologize if I missed a question here and there. I think a lot of you guys are just kind of talking to each other. Uh, question here is concept art book recommendations. I would say a great one is from Weta, the concept art book of District 9. It's a great book. It's not full process. There's no real concept design book in my opinion because it doesn't really go into the inside about the full process of how to do something behind the scenes. It shows you elements of it. It gives you some evidence about what they were doing and, and some visual representation to that. But uh, some of them are very kind of um, obscure or more marketable pieces. So things like the Marvel art books and stuff like that to me, I mean, they look pretty, but in my opinion, it doesn't really go into the inside about the development of it. But the District 9 book is awesome. Thanks for the advice or uh, note on that, Vanzer. Hopefully it does. <laughs> Zenskar is asking, how do you get into a flow state for drawing? You struggle to draw for a long period of time. That's an interesting question and a good one as well because it's such a, a difficult one to understand. And there's no way to really answer as a singular uh, bit of advice or answer to kind of understand the, the elements of control behind it. To be able to flip that switch on and off of getting into that zone or state of flow of being able to just generate and also to stick with the piece throughout a prolonged period of time work. Um, and you know, we can use those words as a state of being, a state of mindset. Uh, for me, the idea of being in the zone, right? Or um, you know, different sports usually have those kind of terminologies about when you get into that mindset where nothing else exists and all you feel is just the presence of that one thing, uh, of what you're doing, and, and nothing else is there. Sound, visual, interactions, you have to be kind of like broken out of it to get your attention, you know? Uh, and, and being able to engage in that in, in a situation where you can kind of flip into it quickly without having to somehow warm up into that situation. You know, how, how does that actually work? And I think it's also from based on person to person. It, it's not so much of a learning process because the individual person, I think, you know, can engage in that through practicing on them maturing as a human being. You know, coming from your childhood, you know, growing up, the moments of, of opportunities of having that chance to be able to go into your own mind and have those curiosities or true interests of things that you do as a kid where there's playing with a toy, you know, and you're able to just fully just immerse yourself into that. But if you're denied this, saying that, hey, stop playing around, you know, you should be doing homework kind of thing. Um, you know, when you're doing homework for school, it's hard for you to get into that zone because you're not interested. So as you're fighting to get into it, eventually maybe you kind of roll into it, you know, um, but for stuff you love to do, instantly, right? Five minutes in, you all of a sudden your time passes by. It's been like half an hour you're doing that thing. Um, but if you deny those experiences when you're very young, I think that could be a part and a factor in where people don't necessarily have enough of that experience to be able to engage in that kind of muscle. 
So for me, that's all I've done since I was the age of five. Since the age of five, all I've done in my youth to growing up was engaging in my interests and no one telling me no. You know, of course I had my duties. You know, I had my public school and, and homework and stuff like that. My parents would go on me and they'd be like, hey, do this and do this and that kind of stuff. But, you know, obviously in many times when I'm just wanted to do my own thing and I had the time to do so, they're not going to say, hey, don't do that. You should be doing more, you know, uh, study of things. They wouldn't no, let me. They, they was, no, they wouldn't say that. They would let me do more of my interests of areas. Um, you know, they'd be critical of, of stuff they didn't like, you know, if I'm playing too many games or something like this. But if I'm drawing, they didn't mind it. And I would draw for hours on end. So because I was doing it for so long, you know, I'm 41 year now, uh, 41 years old now. At the age of five is when I started. So imagine now doing this for over 35 years of nothing but engaging in the muscles of what I like to actually get into the zone on. For me, I can flip into this instantly. It doesn't take me any effort. And the thing is, if most times I'm actually already in the zone of it in most situations, I'm already kind of engaged. So I'm never really out of it. Um, but for a lot of other people, to them, this is a separate element of how they engage in the world. You know, there's regular world and then there's your art thing. And so I got to finish everything in my regular day. And then now I have the time to sit and do my art stuff. And so because you you segregated that from that kind of experience, you now have to kind of create these partitions in your mind to be able to engage in certain ways. And to click into that is probably kind of hard. Because the other things that are there could be stressful, they could be anxious, you could be tired, physically, mentally, whatever the case is. So then you have to kind of put that away somehow and somehow have the energy to engage in the other thing. And for people that are probably like this, they probably have a hard time, you know, not only just engaging within the same things you have to want to do within art, but then staying with it for a long period of time. After like an hour, they're like, I'm done, I'm tired, you know. But I can draw for like five, six hours straight. Not that it's healthy. There's balance that's important as well too, but I can do that. Um... The time disappears, but it's an interesting topic for me because of the fact that it's such an interesting mental side of how people, you know, um, psychologically engage in things that they have interest towards, and where does that really come from, and how does how do you activate that muscle? Uh, and there's probably so many variables and no real one answer, uh, but you know, I, I think it does come from your environment, your youth, uh, how you know how much time you you've spent activating those things. Um, and how much you've been denied that situation. I don't know if that makes sense, but kind of makes sense to me. <laughs> Shemi's asking, how can I do, uh, start doing storyboards? Copy. Copy storyboard artists, you know? Uh, there are storyboard art books. I'm talking about like actual like movie books. You know, a lot of anime will do this. Uh, Miyazaki, for instance, right? Ghibli stuff. They'll make art books and they have like these storyboard books. Copy those. Um, without really being concerned about like compositions and shots and editing and camera all that kind of stuff and those you should be engaging in educationally in the future but at the beginning you just understand frame and just kind of drawing in what level of information you'd be putting into a storyboard and then kind of following it along doing actual movie studies you know look at a sequence kind of draw it and sketch it as, as you look at it then reboard your own iterations using camera I think could be important at an early part of storyboarding understand cameras and lenses I'm just saying also get cameras it could be just your phone. Practice on things, things like shots and compositions and stuff, you know? You don't need formal education just to begin to take photographs. So I'm going to keep working away at this a little bit more. Apologies for not going to jump into the questions just yet. So we're going to be sticking around for about another half an hour or so. Uh, in about a half an hour, this will be done for sure. And I know this with certainty. But I'm sure people can be a little bit annoyed when I stop drawing and just talk, talking nonstop. So we're going to kind of break away and just keep sketching a little bit here and there. Uh, we'll come back to the questions in just a moment. But of course, you know... Um, do let me know of any information about things you'd like to see more of uh, on these kind of streams. Uh, do you only like seeing just drawing and sketching? Do you mind these kind of questions and answers? Uh, I'm going to move my camera back a little bit. I feel like it's awkwardly close to my face as I'm looking down. So give me one second. I should have changed this a bit ago, but... Um, camera control. Let's zoom it out a little bit. There we go. That's better. I don't like weirdly cropped shots. I'm particular that way. Uh, 
Uh, let's see, hold on. Let me see what the other questions were. Multimultros is saying, I feel like I'm having uh, trouble thinking too much about an audience because you're entering your own adult years. I feel like I don't have enough time left. I feel I need to gain success as soon as possible to be. Okay. Well, if you're saying you're entering your adult years and you feel like you're already going to be too late or left behind uh, or not have enough time left to it, I mean, I understand how that can feel being a young person. You know, if w when I was a young person, you know, it seems like it's the end all, right? If I don't get it now, it's going to be too late. Uh, you know, what happens when I'm in my 20s and 30s and 40s? Maybe you are only entering your teens and 20s. I'm not sure what that actually means based on your statement. But if you're saying you're entering your adult years, it kind of sounds like you're moving into your, you know, late teenage years to 20s. And if that's the case, you have plenty of time to understand the engagement, engagements of things. And even then, by the time you have to really consider it, it'll be a different world. Uh, how we engage with people, how social media works, all that stuff will have changed probably dramatically. Sorry, the lighting is also kind of harsh. So I want to turn this down a little bit. So I keep adjusting things today, but it's because we haven't streamed in a while. So I'm having to like notice small things that are bothering me. I'm a little bit OCD when it comes to this. I'm sure you realize that. So when something is on my mind, it like stays there and I have to change it. And I have to uh, act on it or else um, I'll be thinking about it nonstop. This is how it's also when I'm doing actual work. When I think of an idea, it gets stuck in there and I have to get onto the page. And if I don't, it stays in there for days and I can't stop thinking about it. OCD. I don't know how extreme it is. It's not like I'm trying to organize things that have to be in the exact same spot, but I am pretty organized about like where things need to go. <laughs> so I, I'm, I acknowledge the fact that I have this as a, a disorder, I'm sure. Sorry, my, my chat is kind of stationary right now because I'm looking at some of the questions. So some of the later ones I'll get to in just a moment. Um... Jonah, thank you. Welcome. Thanks for the comment. Snake of Styles. Yeah, I hope that, you know, the conversations today can kind of give you some thoughts. Appreciate it, Harry. Thank you for the information and, and also the encouragement for the conversations. Is an F-18 Hornet from Vanzer. <laughs> okay. Maybe one day we'll draw an airplane, uh, a Hornet or a, uh, a jet of some kind. My favorite jet, uh, growing up as a kid, you know, the F-16 was big in the 80s, so I loved that plane a lot. Uh, but then, you know, as I got a little bit older and started studying a lot more in aviation and drawing planes, uh, I, you know, I was a big fan of a lot of the World War II and um, prop planes. So, of course, you know, after having watched also then Poco Rosso from Ghibli films, I, I fell in love with seaplanes as well, too. So, you know, looking at the Maki, you know, M67 and stuff like that uh, were great models. And I love these kind of seaplanes. Uh, then, of course, you know, um, the, the World War II planes. Uh, the Mustang was great, but I was a huge fan of Lockheed design. So uh, I fell in love with the SR-71 back when I was, you know, a kid in the 90s as well, too. Everyone had that big SR-71 poster. I had one as well, the Blackbird. And then X-Men kind of made it really big, you know, and then... Um, as I, you know, as I said, as I got older and sketching, drawing at airplanes, uh, the the um, P thirty eight Lightning was one of my favorites, and it still is to this day. Uh, as a plane to draw, and as a plane to look at, especially watch fly. But man, there's tons of planes I like actually. But jets, j jets were like a '90s thing for me. Um, and the F eighteen is an awesome airplane. But when the when the F thirty five came out. From Lockheed and they had that big joint strike fighter competition from Boeing and, and uh, Lockheed and the F-35 was kind of being developed I thought it was such a cool plane but man that thing is just an engineering nightmare there was a video I just watched recently of another crash that I, I don't think it was recently but it happened where it was on a hovering state and it came down to land and then I think something went wrong with the engine it kind of kicked off on the back end and it hit the the tarmac and it kind of skidded around at the very last moment the pilot ejected and then I think the, the plane burst into flames or something like this but that plane has just been uh it's cool but also disastrous in terms of like the amount of cost it takes to kind of run one of those things the f-35 sorry plane talk <laughs> apologies but most of you here are probably like i have no interest in airplanes um 
Let's see. Demo is asking, you want to draw, but I don't, but you don't. Uh, whenever I try to draw, I start to get frustrated because I can't focus on what you're doing. I also struggle with mental disorders. Yeah, any advice on that? Um, you know, when you're beginning, if this is your, you know, something you're actually just kind of starting with, uh, of course, be careful of making this something that's so pressure oriented. You don't have to perform for anybody. It's not like you have to do this for anybody else, just for you. And so because it's just for you, draw the things you like first, right? From there, find the people or, or um, artists of inspiration that you want to be able to parallel with. When I say parallel, you're following along with them. You don't have to be them, and nor would I ever recommend that. You want to be who you are. But at the same time, we can have multiple inspirations of parallels that we can find to help us navigate these difficult frustrations and direct us in a pathway to get to those point A to Bs. So, um, you know, use those artists then to do copies from, study from them directly. And master copies is something I mentioned earlier and something we do as a, as a child and up to the even of education in colleges. Master copies are standard practices of education. So that's something you should also do, Devin. Okay, we're going to move away from the head of this creature and move into our little saddle here. I kind of imagine layers of leather that eventually becomes a seat. And these are all like straps that are going around the creature. And I'm not gonna I'm gonna highlight this area a bit lighter in value, and the creature around it will be a bit darker in value, so you can kind of see the separation of the materials. Bring this up a little bit higher. All this down here, I'm gonna drop down in darks. And I'll zoom out a little bit, and you can see it better in just a moment. Just keep working your way at this region on this side. Tyler was asking, when you hatch, how do you choose a direction of the lines? Is it always towards a light source? No. There are multiple directions, and there is no right or wrong, Tyler. But there is one thing I would suggest, which is consistency. Whatever direction you choose for hatching, be consistent with it. If you start mixing and matching a bunch of things, then it feels very incoherent and confusing. So regardless of whatever you choose to do, and there's multiple pathways in hatching. There's with the motion, there's with the form, there's with the pattern of things, there's with the surface and texture, possibly of light. Uh, there's also just aesthetics based on a control of a consistent movement, a line like a radial effect. So there's no one way to do it, but be consistent if anything else. Amuya is asking how will AI affect the art and feature? I have no idea. <laughs> and um, simple as that. Nobody knows. And we'll find out. Good or bad. Let's see what else we got here. Um... Got to asking, should I give up on drawing? And I will get better, no matter what. I have no idea what you mean. Uh, if you give up on drawing, then no, you will not. Unless you have different interests of a skill set. And if you invest on, in that, good luck with it. Again, doing more hatching in these areas to push form and overlaps, using it to kind of show layerings on front to back, framing some of these elements, pushing things dark in the background, maybe lighter to the front, turning with the form. Most of these are kind of moving with form. Let's go to this figure in here. I'm going to push the leg in the background dark in value. It'll be a situation of a silhouette. And we'll frame then his front leg. We'll have this kind of grade eight downwards. The back end cape piece also too, we'll kind of push that into the background using hatching systems. Right now, uh, we're primarily hatching. This is not cross hatching. There is a difference to them.
There's a little bit of build up of fibers on the pen. Give me one second here. Just getting some paper towel. Just kind of wiping off the end of it. Hopefully all of you guys are having a good year. It's already March right now. Uh, almost end of March, really. Um, and the year will only just start to get busier once April and May hit for me. I will be in Asia in April. I'll be traveling out there to Japan and Tokyo and then also to Taiwan. I'll be there for about, about two weeks at the most, maybe 10 days. Just more of a personal trip seeing some people. I have some family out in Japan. Uh, a brother stationed out there for work, what he does, and, and he uh, is a civilian but works with the Air Force out there. Um, so I'm going to go see him, which has been a couple of years since I've seen him and family, uh, nephews and sister-in-law, and they're in Japan. Uh, when I get back in May, I'm going to go to Yellowstone as well too, a trip with some friends and artist friends. We'll be sketching and taking photographs of a lot of animals in Yellowstone. Um, classes will begin in May. And then in June is when Monster Palooza happens, a convention, which I'll be at for uh, sharing new work and prints and uh, sculpture piece that I'm producing. And then after May, June, then July is Comic Con in San Diego. That's the end of July. And I'll be there uh, with a couple of artist friends as well, too. And we'll be running the booth at the table. Uh, Super Ronnie will not be there, obviously, but uh, I'll be representing them uh, as a part of it. Not officially, but more of just in spirit. So Comic Con will be coming up the end of June, July, and then August. Uh, there's something else going on there. Actually, no, August is a pretty empty month, which is nice. September, I'll be in Africa. I'll be in Kenya for about 10 days, and then I'll also be in Poland. I'll be in Poland in September because I'll be there for an event called Promised Land. So I am planning to go to that event and show. If anybody is in the uh, European region, uh, Eastern Europe as well too, Ukraine and whatnot, um, to Poland and otherwise, uh, obviously the dire situation is unfortunate, uh, but I do hope people in local regions are able to, or capable to be able to travel a little bit, uh, artists as well too, young people, to come and engage and to participate in, a, in an artist art community as well too, in a positive sense, uh, and come and celebrate. So I'll be there doing a talk, workshop as well too. Hopefully this whole situation can, uh, I don't know, about settled really. It's kind of payback now, but <laughs> it's rough out there, man. Feel bad about it. There's a lot of unfortunate things been happening in the last couple of months internationally. Uh, people that I do know out there in places like even in Turkey where they had a pretty rough earthquake. And there are people still su uh, suffering out there at the moment. And um, I have an archery friend who, who made my, a lot of my arrows for me and he posts a lot of stories about what's going on over there uh in turkey he's like oh man that's rough i've always wanted to visit turkey as well too i was invited several years ago for a workshop didn't get to make it i wish i did but hopefully in the future poland i've been to many times um for that show and event we'll see if there's any other shows i'll go to India would be awesome, uh, Amuya. I would love to see India, for sure. I've had many people, uh, friends in the industry back in the day when we were working in corporate fields, um, industry level, where they would have a lot of uh, artists, you know, a, a, like studios, essentially, in India that would help with things like animation, um, you know, 3D modeling and stuff like this. So the industry out there is, is, it exists, you know, students as well, too, interest within art and design. There's a lot of young people that are very into it. I have several students right now, you know, coming from India. And um, to be able to actually engage in some sort of workshop or event would, out there would be also really fun. I used to travel a lot, you know, before the pandemic. In the last couple of you know, years, I haven't, I haven't really done anything as much. But before that, you know, a lot of the mainstay locations I would, I would hit would be like Paris to Austria, um, Austria. Austria and Australia, uh, to also Denmark. Um, I'd be going to places like Poland as well too. So these places I used to travel to, you know, annually, 
year doing workshops and talks and classes. So because in the last couple of years I've been doing so, I've missed it quite a bit. I miss traveling a lot, actually. Uh, to be able to engage with people internationally, again, continues to really educate me in terms of how uh, we're all pursuing the same kind of things and being able to see how they're developing their skills and where they're getting their education and how a lot of them are just super hungry. You know, in, in the States right now, we have a lot of great, well, uh, better now than it was a couple of years ago, but having a lot of access points of, you know, education information, things like classes locally and whatnot. And I'm talking I'm talking mostly about, you know, some of the areas here in the West Coast. Uh, it's not everywhere in the U.S., but it, obviously it does exist. Um, and things now are more online anyways, but still, uh, being able to travel back then and meeting certain students who didn't really have a lot of opportunities for education like that, it shows just, because even though they don't have access to it, but their work was always really good. And it just showed just how much real hunger there was out there in some of these places. Again, like when I would travel to Poland, um, a lot of the Eastern European people from you know, that specific location in the country of Poland to Ukraine, even to Russia, and of course, other, other places around there, I just had so much hungry, hungry artists and designers, and they were working their asses off. I've talked about this already in one of the live streams, but then I would go to like Australia and same kind of thing. There would a lot of, be, a lot of international people that would come to that school out there in a place called Adelaide. Um, and that was in um, a school called CDW, Concept Design Workshop. And it's an accredited school now, but man, there would be a lot of hungry young kids out there too, just really going for their, um, you know, their skills. But, you know, when I would teach here in the States, because a lot of this stuff was so readily available, it's not to say they weren't hungry. It's just that, you know, it was, it was familiar to them. It was something that they knew it was existing. Um, so there wasn't any sort of like immediate rush you know, to move in that way. Uh, but then when I would travel and meet these you know, students and any opportunity and chance to be able to talk and speak, they would just be hounding me with questions and stuff. Uh, and it was great because the energy I really fed from, I fed, I fed from it. Uh, so I like being able to interact with international um, students and people interested in the world of art and design because just the level of, again, engagement and energy was just through the roof. <laughs> yeah, Magalers in Adelaide. And, Adelaide is great. Went there for one of the workshops uh, in Australia. They were, I was supposed to be back there uh, again, I think last year, but then, you know, they went online instead. Uh, hopefully in the future, I'll go back to it. Now, the school out there, CDW, is a great place. It's one of the highly rated concept art schools. Uh, they've been around there for a couple of years, and they're good people, really good people. I like visiting Australia because that would always give me an opportunity to go to New Zealand. So New Zealand is one of my favorite countries. Uh, I have a lot of good friends out there as well, too. And this is why I have so much interest in you know, Maori culture and, and whatnot. Not just Maori culture, but also um, Polynesian cultures. And I have such an affinity and connection to how they engage in the world around them. Uh, obviously, you know, I have no Polynesian uh, affiliation in my, in my culture, but uh, I, I like being able to educate myself within cultures. Something about the Polynesian people, they're just really amazing. I just kind of scrolled back a little bit. There was a question I just wanted to see. Owen was asking, uh, you're a young artist, young artist who is 14. And just wondering as an artist, what who wants to go into the entertainment industry? Should you uh, specialize and pick one specific thing to tailor your portfolio to? Um, basically, again, the question was, should as a young person who is educating themselves, wanting to get into the entertainment industry, focus on something specific or generalize? And in my opinion, in the beginning, is to not generalize or be specific, but to experiment. Experiment within the field of that industry and what they offer. What specific techniques, what kind of themes of engagement, industry or medium. It could be games or concept art, but it could also be things like toy design or things like environmental design, theme parks and stuff like that. Movies, of course, are great and ga uh, games to comics are also fun. But in the world of entertainment design, there's so, such a broad sense of that. And the, and the trinity of this, of course, is in game, animation, and film. But those are just the three of the multi-other elements that are out there when it comes to entertainment work. So in the beginning, to kind of tap into those other possibilities, to expose and understand that, hey, these are other things I could be doing. Because right now, you may have no idea. So the more you expose yourself to that, all of a sudden, you might realize there was an interest there that you didn't really understand that was there for you. But now you found an a, a avenue to be able to engage and to invest in the energy of that direction 
and then you would specialize that in, in terms of a specific direction of a primary gear. It doesn't mean into your future you're not allowed to be able to engage in multiple different diversities of, of themes and practices or mediums or industries. You can, but in time, as you graduate or you're a student, you shouldn't be able to do all those things at once. And in a four-year education, you're not going to be able to do so, uh, let alone only four years. Some people are in school for like six, seven years, you know. So being able to be able to specialize gives you the enough competitive nature in your quality of work uh, to be able to get out there and, and get that kind of position that you want. Um, and I recommend that. Have a primary direction and eventually diversify the portfolio as you mature and as you engage in that work. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't students that, you know, are finishing schools and educational platforms and are able to somehow generate all this professional level work in all of those different fields of environment design, creature and character and props and all those things, world building. Of course, there's a percentage of people that can, but it's a small percentage. Um, most of the students that I've had in the past, you know, are, are usually going to be very good at one specific kind of an area. And even though they feel like, but I, shouldn't I put in environment work, even though I want to do character stuff? It's like, well, is your environment work just as good as your character stuff? Did you even have the time to engage your skill sets to be equally as good in those both fields? Um, maybe, but most likely not. So it's also based on then of interest. Maybe your interest is in within character stuff primarily. But if you're being coerced or coaxed into more environment in, in, in your own thinking because you think, well, there's more opportunities in environment design. I can get better jobs out there. Well, sure, you can get that job, but what if you're not hired for that and that's all you got to do? Do you like to do it? You know, and if you don't, and if you go, well, I'm getting paid well, well, okay, fine, but that'll last only so long until you want to, you know, leave. You'll hate it. Um, so it's probably better to, to you know, go for something that's a bit more challenging and difficult in the beginning and to really establish that uh, and to make it, you know, by risk and chance and instead of just kind of going the route that you think is going to be easier. Just because you want to get your foot in the door. Because, you know, I think when you're younger, of course, it's pretty obvious that you don't really think about the longevity of things. You just want to think about your first opportunity. I just want to start working. Um, but, you know, as someone who is a bit older, I can't help but initiate that thought of, you know, we'll think about long term, you know. How's it going, Crazy Popcorn? Welcome. Magular saying CDW does a lot of work. They opened up a studios in Sydney. I heard about that in Melbourne recently. So they really spread out. They're working with a university out there, I think called um, First University or something like this. I can't remember what they're called, uh, but they're accredited, which is great. They even go to those local schools and workshops and high schools. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, they're growing quite a bit in the last couple of years. The pandemic actually probably helped them if anything else. Which a lot of schools didn't survive uh, the last couple of years of this shutdown stuff. A lot of them went online. Uh, they never came back to a physical location. You know, for me, I taught mostly in physical locations of schools uh, for most of my experience. And so in the last two, three years, I've converted mostly online through my own school, but I've missed the in-person stuff a lot. Especially the stuff that I teach is so important to have as in person, to go see the actual things. So today, being at the zoo and drawing with students, today was the first time actually taking students to the zoo to go draw after like three years. So it was a lot of fun. The classes I teach in person are here in Pasadena, California, and it's with the art, uh, art store. And I run my classes through them, essentially. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to go back to Art Center or some of the other schools. And some have expressed interest. But um, being able to control my own schedule, you know, and my own curriculum, my own, you know, uh, system of, of flow of how I do it, I can't pass it up. Dropping all that down in the shadow. I'm actually probably going to push it down even more later on. Let's go into the arms section over here. We're almost done. Probably in about another 20 minutes or so probably left on this thing. Uh, going a little bit longer than I wanted to, but still. We're pretty good. We definitely have a lot more questions above. Let me just see real quickly. Um, Wyvern is asking, how do you start studying from masters? I have tried studying other artists, application of concepts and fundamentals. I'm pretty curious about how you approach learning from masters. Well, there's two ways to learn. 
Simply, I'll just state it like this. One way is to do a one-to-one -one copy. Whatever you look at, you transfer it 100% as close as possible, right? And you'll learn because you get the sense of how they get to those levels of finish. The other way, which I think is also very important, is to understand how to be able to specialize a focal point, uh, an area of education. So it could be within those fundamental sense, right? Maybe I want to understand propor uh, proportion really good based on how that particular person draws characters or creatures or whatever the case is. Maybe it's within composition effects. How does that artist compose his frame or his or her frame? So you study just a composition. It could be a full painting, but you don't do a painting. You draw out shapes and lines that understands the composition of that painting, right? Maybe I just want to study the anatomy of that figure, even though I have a whole scene with 20 different characters, but I just want to study the anatomy of that one character. You can focalize a specific of what you want to extract that information from. And as you do so, the intention becomes very clear and you isolate, you isolate that information. Maybe it's just line. I want to study how that person just does hatching. Do you have to entirely draw and hatch out the entire illustration? Maybe it's just that one little area because I want to see how he moves in that spot. You can do this. I hope that helps. Pet Ho had a question. Pet Ho said, Procreate iPad Pro is definitely a game changer. Uh, yes. I don't know about game changing, but they definitely did good things. Um, just wondering where it will go in a year or two. Definitely feeling anxious about the future of commercial art. I mean, I would imagine it would be the same or if not better. <laughs> uh, because the same kind of work will be there based on the kind of properties of, of products that are being generated. That people are consuming as uh, visual things or interactive things. As movies and games or illustrations and comics that people are reading. I don't think those mediums are ever going to really alter. In terms of how they're being done and generated. And yeah, the technology will change. And It'll you know, have different approaches. And if one thing gets taken over by a technology, by more of its industrial kind of process, um, those specific artists will have to you know, gravitate towards how to apply their skills in different areas. It doesn't mean they can't necessarily make those same things, but it may not be with those companies. Um, and in a lot of ways, what it will hopefully do is you know, generate more interest of actually developing your own internal stuff. People are obviously going to fight back, and as they should, in terms of maintaining their positions and, you know, um, value of their artistic skill sets in the industries that they've built. So it doesn't mean that's going to completely knock them out. If it does, it would be unfortunate. And, and that's something that people are trying to fight against. Uh, and rightfully so. You, you want to maintain uh, a sense of not ownership, but and it's not even control either. Quality, you know, quality and passion that goes into that thing. Because people invest so much of their lives into the whole thing. So when technology comes in and, and you know offers a very cheap route of development of, of a process, uh, I think the soul of the work is lost. Uh, so you know, as people who are in the industry of, of that field, you know, they feel so passionate about the work that they generate that of course they're gonna want to latch onto it. But you know, does it stop the machine of things? No, no, it won't. Uh, and, and people don't necessarily have to just accept it. But um, Time will always just move forward. And in time, it will reveal as to how things will come about. And there's no way to predict it. Uh, Fruit Punch is asking, how do we make art as a career? If I live in a country where art is not thriving? Well, uh, in the country, it may not be the case. But because of the fact that we're now mostly online, uh, the opportunity to connect to people as through the internet clients uh, may be a viable source. So maybe whatever culture or country you come from, can generate visual inspiration and stories that maybe are not as visibly seen out there. And you can use that as a way to share your own culture or uh, to generate work of things that are not so, you know, kind of repetitive out there. Uh, and that could be on you to be able to develop this. Um, why not, right? But, you know, in terms of how you can develop a career within that, like I said, turning online and actually start generating products. Of course, first, your skill sets have to be at a certain level that competes to the things that are already out there. Uh, and if you've already built your education system or, or I guess your experience that is personally through your own thing or through a system of a school, hopefully that skill set is strong enough to be able to generate those products. But then what you make from that is how you can generate a career. You have to make something, right? And what that something is, is based on your choice. What do you think people want to buy from you? What do you even like to generate to sell? Now, if you're talking about, let's say, companies and industries, I mean, you know, right now it's still strong where 
not strong in the sense that the type of working relationship at the moment in time being is still very much on the idea of remote working. Um, and so potentially finding careers of being able to be where you live and working for certain clients and companies that are not necessarily in your country is still potentially there. Not easy to find because there's so much competition, but you have access to that information, you know, through career channels and uh, group chats and things like this of live streams and finding, you know, individual people you can kind of work with, uh, whether through social media or classes you can take online. You got to build a network. It's not an answer there, but you know, it, it's not easy either. Uh, but all you got to do, obviously, is continue to um, genuinely develop stuff you love to do. All right, we're going to be on for maybe the last 15 minutes here. And 15 minutes. So if anybody has any other comments, uh, suggestions, thoughts, things you want to share, now would be the time to do so. Uh, I'll probably keep working on this a little bit more later on today, uh, just to kind of fine tune, tune up, if anything else, in some of the portions and pieces. But uh, I think generally most of what I wanted to be able to establish was pretty much there. So. And of course, this will be shared on my YouTube channel. Uh, so if you're subscribing, you can watch it again from the beginning and kind of see how this little sketch and piece of a drawing started out. Let's see what else. There were a couple last questions too. Naki Tunes is asking, do I plan to go to New York Comic Con this year? Uh, I would like to. I was invited by the Super Ronnie crew because they're not they're not going, but they still have access to the tables because of, you know, Kim jong and Super Ronnie stuff. So they're going to retain control of it because, you know, obviously in the future, they want to come back and, and share more of the Super Ronnie artists. Even though Kim jong is not with us anymore, uh, you know, his spirit will live on through the branding of Super Ronnie and printing of books. And more of his content will come out because he has many, many drawings that they haven't released just yet. But you have to first kind of, you know, fine tune a lot of that stuff based on family and whatnot. And that's their personal things. Um, but all of us who are part of Super Ronnie are still here and generating new work. And so uh, I can imagine that, you know, we'd like to be able to visit that one time. But will I go this year? It's kind of up in the air. I'm, I'm going to say most likely not for the time being. Next year, though, I would like to. I would like to. I mean, to be honest, like even this year, if the opportunity came and which is there, but also the timing worked out really well. I would be interested. I would be. And I haven't been to Comic Con New York. Uh, I've heard great things about it. I would love to see it. Last time I was in New York, I was like 10 years old. Uh, and that was like in the 1990s, early 90s, late 80s, <laughs> something like this. So I'm sure it's a very different environment than what I remember. Let's see here. Um, MF was saying, need to commission art on the front of a trade paperback cover. What tool do you recommend? We're thinking Posca paint pens. Well, if you're commissioned to do a cover of a trade paperback, um, I would be honestly just using straight pencil and pen. Uh, if you're applying color, then you know using a little bit of like color pencil probably would be good or watercolors. Uh, Poscas are fine, but they're so, I mean, you need a lot of them to get a variation of color sets and values. Uh, markers would be maybe a little bit easier to use as well, too. But um, it depends on if you have color or black and white. But I would just be using things like straight felt tip pens, uh, ballpoint maybe. There's so many situational things that would come into the question. Stargate in Mexico? I mean, yeah, again, even in South America, I've always wanted to visit. Uh, haven't had a chance to really go down there at all, and I would love to actually. Um, I find the culture down there to be also very interesting and uh, fuel source wise, a lot to pull from. Despite you know what's going on with the news and stuff, but media wise, it's always going to blow it out. You know, weird stuff. But I, I don't care about you know whether or not it's going to be dangerous. I don't really listen to that. It's like to me, I know there's good people out there, so I want to go see it. You just link up with the right people, then you'll be fine.
Let's see. Uh, that's a couple questions over here. Mm. <clears throat> Advice for cutting back on rendering. I over render concepts, simplify painting and such. Uh, well, you know, in terms of rendering side, I think timings can be really important. Timers can help you kind of step back a little bit to re you know, assess the situation of how much you're rendering. Uh, stepping away from it completely and looking at it with fresh eyes can help a lot too. From there, having a very strong sense of intention again, intention of what you're even trying to communicate or do. For instance, in terms of stylistically, uh, as we talked about artists of inspirations and parallels, what they would generate can you also match up to in terms of what kind of render you're, you're trying to go for. Uh, where do you want the render to go? You know, where do you want the eye to see? If you render the entire image, it becomes kind of uh, flat and also a bit uh, distracting as to what to look at. So controlling where your focal point goes can be the highest of render and can kind of navigate through the image and guide the viewers within that through your render. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. I apologize. There's a couple of questions I may have missed. So if I missed your question and you want something to be answered, just kind of copy and paste it again, please. Um, how did I learn digital painting? Just by doing it. I started doing digital paint uh, Photoshop work back in 1998. <laughs> uh, I was in high school in 98, and I was, what, 17 years old? Uh, and me and my friend Izzy, we would use the computer in the library, and we would check out a Wacom tablet, which was like the size of a table, and we would sit there for like, you know, lunch times or after class and we'd just be working, playing with it, generating these, you know, fun little digital illustrations. And we use like the lens flare and filters and stuff like that. It was like Photoshop, you know, 2 or something like this. I can't remember. Um, you know, but that's how early it started. But then, you know, going from high school, then going into, I went to a um, associate's degree program of, of college, a two-year program. We used, you know, more Adobe programs at that point, Illustrator, Photoshop again, getting introduced to just the UI and the system of it more in, a, in an actual kind of system. Uh, and then from there, obviously Art Center introduced us more of the nuance of actual painting. So traditional painting, oil, acrylic, watercolors, that kind of stuff. And those skill sets transferred to digital. Maddie, you're asking which shoes? You're asking what, if I got them. Which shoes are you asking about? I have a lot of shoes. <laughs> Vanzer is asking, what is this piece for, for you, for, for you guys, for the, for the stream? So this is not a commission. I'm not being paid for this, per se. Um, this is just something I just want to draw. I sketch all the time. Last night, what did I sketch? I sketched Wolverine, actually. <laughs> This is what I drew last night because I was super uh, into recently collecting old comics again and um, I was really deep diving into an artist uh, which I've loved for, for many, many, many years, decades since I was just young, uh, Barry Winston Smith. And BWS, Barry Winston Smith, created this amazing series of uh, Weapon, Weapon X, you know, the Marvel Comics Presents Weapon X, uh, an amazing comic graphic novel series most incredibly illustrated stuff from Marvel from Wolverine stuff. So if you want a bit of inspiration of like Wolverine, I love Weapon X series. And so I wanted to draw that. I was like, oh, I couldn't get it out of my head. Same thing. It was in my head. I had to get it out. So I wanted to draw it. Uh, before this one was the, uh, the arm wrestling, which I posted this one on social media a couple of days ago. And so this Wolverine one I wanted to do just to play with it. it again, I didn't post this one. I just drew it last night because I wanted to draw. Uh, but yeah, Barry Winston Smith, amazing illustrator. And he falls under the category of a lot of like these pulp comic guys back in the day. Guys like uh, Bernie Wrightson, you know, um, even like Will Stout. They ha have a very kind of similar look, which is more of the kind of contemporary uh, generation that stem from the guys from like the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s. You know, guys like uh, Charles Janet Gibson to um, Franklin Booth or to, you know, Heinrich Kley. They had these draftsmen back in the time they were just invested in developing illustrations and pieces and advertisements and illustrations and sketches uh, that were just amazing uh, heavily invested in the line work and of course even like the art nouveau period was a big inspiration of that as well too uh, everyone understands and knows you know Alphonse Mucha and stuff like that so these you know guys that came out in the 70s and the 80s were, were pushing that kind of work um, and so you know I grew up looking at comics in the 90s early 90s to so late 80s so to me that stuff kind of stood out uh, and of course with fantasy work we had guys like the obvious um, 
people that were out there, uh, Frank Pizzetta and whatnot. So it was it, it was that period of time of, of illustration that was so fantasy oriented, but the kind of work they were generating was so line oriented. Uh, and Barry Winter Smith was just one of those people that stood out to me because of his rendition of Wolverine. And I loved Wolverine as a character as a kid. Uh, it was, he was one of, my, one of my favorites, as he was for many, many young kids in the 90s, um, 80s and 90s. He was just so violent. <laughs> you know? and, and when you're a kid, you like that violence aspect of it. Uh, when you're growing up with, with DC Comics and stuff like that, and you know they had their own stints of becoming these kind of characters that were very dark and, and whatnot. And, and I think as kids, you're attracted to that kind of thing. It's you know, adult. It's not kid-friendly you know, anymore. Oh, so Maddie was asking about the shoes. The Kim Jong-gi shoes? No, I did not. Um, I didn't even know it was coming out. <laughs> this is something they were doing in Korea alone uh, as a collaboration within a company and a brand called Casina. Uh, I would have loved to have gotten a pair, but I didn't even know it was coming out into it. So when they released it on the website in Korea, they, they sold out like instantly, apparently. Um, the manager in the U.S., you know, we talked about it. It's like, oh, do you want a pair? I was like, if you get it, great, but I'm not really, you know, pushing for it. Um, it seemed cool. It was great to see some of the artists come together and, and you know, share their skill sets and, and kind of their, um, you know, obviously remembering Kim jong Gi's passing and whatnot. And to be able to do those sketches on the shoes were really fun. Uh, it would have been kind of cool to be a part of it. But, you know, like I said, it was kind of more of, of something that they had began in Korea. Um, and it and brought some of the artists within it. And I'm sure they would like to have asked a lot of people. But, you know, I'm glad who they, who they got were some really high profile names. I don't hold a candle to guys like Otomo and stuff like this, but you know, still. Uh, v Hart is asking a uh, question, listening by your at work, but if you did, I'll watch it later. But a uh, question was about how to finish a piece when you constantly have new ones. Well, if you have, a, I missed that question. If you have a piece that you're trying to work on and you haven't finished it because you started a new piece, <clears throat> it's kind of like even the question of like how do I finish a sketchbook you know how many sketchbooks do you guys finish in a year is it even one is it ten for me you know average wise it's up to about six or seven sketchbooks a year fully finished up and that's my personal books back when I was teaching art center days uh, and local colleges you know I'll finish up to like 14 books a year um, but if we're talking about the actual illustrations and pieces you, you know I understand that can be a, a sense of like not a burnout, but you have distractions and interests of other things. And so you kind of go that direction to kind of work on that brand new idea, which is always fun to kind of generate something brand new. Um, I think sometimes you just need a reminder, maybe sometimes a calendar. Uh, having a hard deadline can really kind of coerce you back to finishing that one piece. If it's for yourself, you don't really have to establish a deadline for yourself because, again, you can take as long as you want to. But I think it's good to maybe even maybe establish that if that's, not, if that's the case where you don't really have that kind of deadline. And so that you know that you have to get it done at a certain period of time. So it's okay to step away from it, have new eyes on it, do something else as you wait for that to be kind of settled down, and then kind of revisit it if you can. But have a hard date as to like when you need to get it done. Halo Gear is mentioning that one video in, uh, uh, on my Instagram cannot be rewatched anymore for some time. Um, the one in my garden sharing the old sketchbook back when I was in Art Center. Yeah, I, I don't remember what video that was, honestly. Uh, maybe in the future, maybe even this week, I'll do another video live stream that kind of shares a sketchbook tour, old stuff, maybe from Arts in the Days and uh, old books. If you guys are interested in seeing it, hey Jack, how's it going, man? How do you keep your love for drawing and art fresh and alive? Are, your, are there methods you use to avoid burnout or things you would uh, do to get yourself out of feeling that way? Absolutely. Interests and hobbies that I have further continue to engage my enthusiasm within the love of also drawing and creating because they are connected together and you might think well how like for me i like doing a lot of archery right now i like going out my back door uh outside in the backyard and shooting my bow and, and doing archery stuff and how is that connected to drawing in any way well it, it's first engaging in some form of uh, activity that is of interest right a curiosity or an interest is something that i really love doing and it may not be the same actions or functions or thought process but because i'm also uh flexing that internal muscle of engaging that zone of period of actually really enjoying what I do, uh, that enthusiasm and energy can be transferred to other stuff. So even though they, they may not be directly connected, it can be used for it. 
So if you're also then doing things that can be connected to it, for example, maybe it's like watching movies, maybe it's playing games, maybe it's building you know model kits, maybe it's you know um, taking photographs and making your own films. Those things are more artistic in nature. So that information, your experience, and then energy can also be infused within your day-to-day -day kind of drawing and sketching as well too. So for me, uh, they are connected. So I'm gonna kind of scroll my way down here a bit now. So. Oh, Maddie, you're saying it was a, a raffle on Adidas app. I missed that too. I didn't even see it. Uh, I'm, you know, I go onto a lot of raffles because I, I collect a lot of sneakers. Um, but yeah, that the news of that particular pair from Casino wasn't really shared as much. I don't know why, but um, I didn't even know about it. I don't know. Even then, would I have gone for it? I mean, maybe. I'm actually trying to reduce my collection, so I'm selling a lot of sneakers right now. Uh, so I don't even know if I would have gone for that piece. I'm actually adding some additional pieces here. The reason why I'm doing this right now is because I'm, I'm not a big fan of the parallel line here of the neck. So I'm actually trying to push his throat section out with fur to kind of create a bit more of an S curve. Because I don't, I, I don't like the silhouetting. It's a little bit static for me. So I'm trying to push the silhouette out like this to create something more of an interesting shape around the neck area. So stuff like that, I didn't notice when I was doing it. Sometimes you notice it after the effect. And when you, when you notice it after the effect, the question can comes into mind of like, well, I messed up and now I should start over, right? It's like, well, I mean, you could, but there's always ways to nudge it, you know, to kind of push in different directions. And through the, the addition effect, uh, you can kind of adjust things visually. Now, if it's like a proportional thing based on an animal or a thing that you actually see, then I'll probably start over because fixing proportion is really tough. Uh, but if it's, you know, adjusting things like maybe a little bit of the design or the silhouette based on a creative idea, uh, my opportunity to actually play with this is actually more open. So my chances of quote unquote saving it uh, is, is there. So I didn't notice that whole aspect of it until just now. So that's why I started adding these pieces. Welcome Super Sonico. Uh, let's see. Starkey is asking, did I see the Pinocchio movie? Um, and the Puss in Boots boot, uh, Puss in Boots movie. No, I did not see that one, Puss in Boots. I've seen the original back in the day. I didn't see the newest one. I did watch Pinocchio, and there were multiple Pinocchio movie film movies. I, I'm sure all of you understand. But the Guillermo del Toro one is the one I watched and loved. It was fantastic. I love stop motion. I've always been a fan of it. I've even done it when I was a kid. You know, me and my friends would play with stop motion, with like Legos, and I'd even done it when I was in junior high, making little uh, sculpty or sculpture uh, characters. I did one with a friend of mine in eighth grade. This is in 1992, 92 or 93, 93, because uh, I started high school in 94. And in 93, I was in an art class, and the art class was run by a teacher of mine. His name was Mr. Avahazy. He's a Native American guy, super awesome dude. And I've been able to stay in touch with him and many other art instructors back in the day. And he was the one that actually first introduced me to the idea of going to a college, or not a college, a high school that was art-centric. So he was actually one of my first art teachers that I had that kind of guided me in a direction of a choice of to go for, uh, Mr. Abahazy. And um, I remember he would let me draw on the wall of a mural piece in the classroom. I, I forgot what, the, I think it was an eagle or something like that I drew. You know, I was just in eighth grade. Uh, and in that class, he would let us experiment a lot in terms of like different art mediums and, and such things. And one of the things I actually played with in eighth grade was doing a stop motion film. And, and it was me and my friend, Dan, who decided to do it. And we did the three billy goats story. The three billy goats, I would cross a bridge and, and run into like a troll, right? And so we, we, I sculpted the three billy goats. And Dan was kind of in, in charge of like the camera and like the whole system of that. And I sculpted all the, the pieces. And instead of a troll, it was like a dinosaur at the end of it. <laughs> so it was a scenario of cut to like the, each of the goats coming through and crossing the bridge. I haven't thought about this experience in years. But um, this is something I had done back in eighth grade, stop motion stuff, because I had watched like Wallace and Gromit at the time. And, you know, there was a lot of cool stop motion films in, in that period as well, too. So uh, I liked stop motion a lot. It's funny, I actually had some experience in animation, uh, even though I didn't go into animation. You know, I did 2D animation studies when I was in my two-year college, uh, which was hard as hell. And I'm glad I did it, but I didn't want to go and do that anymore. And claymation stuff was kind of when I was just a kid, but you know I think all of us maybe experienced that kind of stuff, making films, movies, that kind of stuff, stop motion stuff. 
uh, much easier today to do because we have your phone. Back then we had to actually literally use cameras and stuff like that. Let's punch all this down. All these rock forms, I'm actually going to leave relatively open. I might just draw a little bit of information on the inside, but I'm not going to hatch entirely into it. I'm just going to take away from the, the, the creature and the situation. So we're just going to indicate edges, plane changes, that kind of stuff. But we're not going to fill them in. They're more of a framing device for um, this creature. Yeah, uh, MF is saying Barry Winston Smith just released one of his newest uh, books. He hasn't released anything in like 16 years or something like that. And Monsters was one that was released in 2021. Uh, I've looked through it. I haven't gotten a copy of it. It's massive, but I do want to get it. Apparently, it was a storyline that originally had its origins in The Incredible Hulk. And then it transferred into or transformed into a different storyline. Um, but yeah, I, would, I, would, I definitely want to check it out. Uh, question from Hot Ton Dog is, do I like Brian Froud's work? Uh, artist behind Dark Crystal and such, thought uh, he had an effect on fantasy art. Yeah, absolutely. Brian Froud was amazing. Um, you know, his his books back in the day when he would release the fairy books and the, you know, the, the what is it, those gnome or goblin books were always fantastic. And, you know, yes, of course, I grew up watching, you know, the, the labyrinth and whatnot. Um, so his work definitely had an impact for sure. Uh, and later on, you know, as... You know, his work became a bit more, not prolific, but it continued to kind of have its stay because those properties kept coming back, like The Dark Crystal. The original was just an amazing film. Uh, but the illustration work, we were always in book formats, were really well put together. But they always kind of felt like illustrations. I didn't understand at the, at, when I was a kid that that work was actually connected to those films. Um, but of course, later on, you see them as actual concept art pieces, you know? So um, for sure, you know, his work, Brian Brown stuff, is definitely prolific and, and very important in terms of the industry and also our uh, art community of inspiration. But then, you know, guys like him, but, but also the the, um, the illustrator that worked on a lot of the Lord of the Rings stuff. Uh, what was his name? Was it? I can't remember. It's on my tongue. Uh, you know, but he also worked on the films and whatnot. But uh, he also had a lot of inspiration for a lot of illustrators and whatnot. Um, Supersonic was asking, in the Dynamic Bible book, use your shadows to separate complex details. How does that work exactly? Well, think of what I'm doing right here in this forearm. The forearm has a lot of complex muscles and fur and, and detail to the surface level. But what I've done was I've taken that shape and be able to use a indication of grouping the shadow shapes. So there's a light source coming from the top and the bottom side is going to be in shadow. So I group these areas into a shadow region. And Jean Lee, thank you, Devin. Uh, and then I started to fill in with hatching. Now, I could fill in hatching on the top of all this as well, too. There's indications of that fur a little bit here and there as it blends. But the majority of the information has been grouped into this whole side. So by taking the shadow indication to separate complex information of details, instead of trying to draw every fiber of muscle and fur, I've controlled where I want to place stuff. Not John Lee, Alan Lee. Alan Lee. Thank you for the correction, Rebecca. It was Lee, but different first name. <laughs> I watched this interesting documentary, uh, John Howe and Lee. Thank you for even more clarification, Mr. Rich. Uh, there was an interesting documentary I watched on Amazon Prime uh, last week. It's a bit, it's not for everybody because it's very dialogue heavy, um, but it goes into the, uh, the books of the Audubon. You know, the artists who did a lot of the bird illustrations back in like, you know, the, the early time period. Um, it was like 1800 or something like that, maybe earlier. I was only paying attention so much but because uh, the way it was presented was just kind of droning on. Um, I just found, of course, the images and the illustrations to be fascinating. And, and, you know, I've seen a lot of the Audubon's work and it is fantastic. Um, but man, you know, watching that and seeing his large pieces, he would do these giant illustrations and watercolors of the birds. And he would just kind of like, you know, do them by practice, by observation. That was kind of his big thing. He would just 
observe the birds and just be in that environment nonstop and just and pick up on the nuances of the animals and how they move and how they socialize or how they kind of biologically moved in the environment. And um, he was able to bring these amazing images of birds that just weren't captured the same way in the time period. So, you know, John Audubon's work for the, the bird studies were always really, really cool to see. It's one of the things I like doing is going to antique stores and finding old books, old books that have like biological studies and animals and sea creatures and stuff like that, plants and whatnot. Uh, beautiful paintings of watercolor. I really like natural history books, especially from that early time period. Hey, Logiri, oh, you actually put that the brush pen class on SBS Learn. That's, a, that's an old course. I didn't get to expand on it, unfortunately, because just things got a little bit crazy and I wasn't able to actually, you know, expand on it. And there was supposed to be a part two, which I do apologize it's not up there. But that, you know, basic one, it still gives you the information about how to handle the tool set. Um, and it's difficult. You know, it's six months of work of, of experience that I've, I've culminated down to like, a, what, an hour, an hour of video. Um, and it's all brush pen study, you know, the, the pen tell color brush pen is what I'm using in that situation. All right, we're about two hours, 17 minutes. So this is gonna be the last few minutes. I'm just kind of now touching small little stuff here and there into like dabbing on it, mark, little marks here and there, which signifies that I have now come to the point where I think I'm now done with this piece. Um, let me zoom out a little bit here. So you can kind of see how that looks now. Little bit of visual effects. Maybe some, you know, birds in the background. Giving it some environmental flair. Maybe even like some insects kind of flying around. There was this one uh, comic book, the graphic novel that was done by Ricardo Delgado, who did uh, Age of Reptiles. And I've always loved the way he and Robert's, uh, Will, not Robert, but William Stout would draw dinosaurs because they would draw these dinosaurs that would have all these little flies flying around them. Uh, you know, with all the decaying food around their mouth and stuff like that. I always found that to be really textural and gritty. Uh, and something I pull from. Anyways, uh, anybody else? Any last questions or comments? I think we're about the end point here. I do appreciate you guys hanging about. Um, I think for next week, I would like to be able to do another stream based on maybe even one of the quests about the sketchbook tours, old sketchbooks, and still sketch and draw, obviously, and answer questions and whatnot. But being able to share, you know, sketchbooks and it is always kind of fun. Even this one I'm working on currently, uh, we're about maybe halfway through this book. This is the epic book I've been using, so we're about halfway through. So I still have a good amount of pages to fill into this one. But, you know, this is where now this book has been filled in with a good amount of stuff. So even doing a tour of this book can be really good, and tours of other sketchbooks from the past can be also fun. Uh, in any case, we'll leave it there. You can kind of see the entirety of the image. And we were using fountain pens today. We were using the Esther book uh, fountain pen that I had for this one and the other slightly thinner iter iteration. Um, next time around, subject matter wise, again, like I said, it'll be pretty open as to what I'll draw on sketch. But of course, check it out. You know, hang out, ask questions as much as you'd like to. And um, we'll do it again. So appreciate it. Any other additional comments, put them on, on the bottom. That could be based on suggestions, helpful information, things you'd like to be able to see. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing the, the growth of the YouTube channel continue on as we pass now, hopefully, the 50K of subscribers. And uh, good night. Have a good rest of the weekend. And we'll see you guys possibly next week. See you guys.